I couldn't believe I managed to find myself lost in the fringes of the thick forest that backed onto my town in southern Vermont. You'd think spending a lifetime in the same area would ensure I knew every secret path, but there I was, baffled by my surroundings. The date was August 30th, and I never thought that an innocent hike after work could lead me into one of the most terrifying experiences of my life. As I continued through the unknown parts of the woods, day turned into dusk, and the sunlight began to fade away. The noises from woodland creatures filled the air, an accompaniment to my heavy breathing as I attempted to find something familiar to guide me home. Despite my mounting fear, my frustration bubbled over when I tripped over a protruding root hidden beneath fallen leaves. Cursing under my breath, I begrudgingly picked myself up and dusted off my clothes when I noticed something strange further ahead. In the twilight gloom, amid seemingly ordinary trees, a grotesque and twisted structure reared its head. It almost resembled a bizarre effigy built from twisted animal bones, clearly not a natural formation encountered in any forest I knew of. Suddenly, the unnerving woodland noises ceased entirely, as if even nature itself was repelled by whatever this thing was. Just as my heart rate began to soar at this grisly sight, an eerie whisper made its way through the now silent forest. I see you, uttered a raspy voice that continued in an unintelligible murmur. My pulse rapidly spiked while I stared at what now seemed like an enormous bone sculpture before me. My skin prickled with goosebumps. Something felt intrinsically wrong about this scenario. Dropping all thoughts of trying to find my way home, I decided instead to skin the trees for any indication of who or what might have created this disturbing sight. Squinting into the dusk, I caught a movement in the corner of my eye. About forty feet away, a tall humanoid figure observed my shock stance with unnerving calmness. Even in the dim light, I could see something was very off about this person. They were abnormally tall, appearing emaciated and hunched over like monstrous visions from nightmares. As they moved closer, I noticed their long black hair fell past their waists, and they wore little more than scraps of fabric wrapped around their limbs. Unsure of how to react, I tentatively called out to them. Hey, uh, nice installation you got here? The lanky figure only responded with more incoherent mutterings before suddenly switching from slow meandering to a grotesque and unnatural gait as they advanced towards me. My body began trembling uncontrollably as raw fear coursed through my veins. In that moment, desperate for escape from this horrifying encounter, I took off through the forest, ignoring the voice calling after me. Splinters of branches tore at my clothes, and stinging nettles bit into my exposed skin as I bolted through unforgiving foliage. It felt like an eternity until finally I recognized familiar surroundings. But just when relief started to wash over me, an otherworldly scream pierced deep into my soul. Knowing that whatever had been watching me was still in pursuit put an extra surge of adrenaline into my stride as I burst from dense woodland cover onto a worn path leading back to town. There would be no staying home tonight, anywhere but that cursed forest would have to suit me for now. Attempting to catch my breath on the fringes of safety, I realized all courage had drained from my body instead giving way to sheer terror at the prospect that somewhere nearby lay a creature far beyond anything rational or traditional any of us could comprehend. As I stumbled into town, desperately hoping for refuge from the horrors that plagued me, I approached a group of locals huddled near the only bar in town, murmuring amongst themselves. They glanced at me with suspicion but remained tight-lipped, as if speaking of the monster that chased me would bring it out of hiding. I couldn't bear the thought of remaining silent about what I experienced. 
Desperation gnawed at my bones as I blurted out my encounter in the forest, describing the towering figure that appeared to be a twisted union of man and beast. Their eyes widened as my words filled them with dread and recognition. One man stepped forth, his face etched with years of hardship. His name was Jack, and he was an intelligent and cautious man who'd spent his life chasing unexplained phenomena. He took a swig from his flask before clearing his throat. I know what you saw out there. It's a skinwalker, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. The onlookers suddenly grew silent, fear settling over them like an ominous cloud. Jack pulled out an old newspaper, its pages yellowed with age, and showed it to me. The headline read, Skinwalker Terrorizes Small Town. Chilling photographs accompanied the article, featuring grotesque acts committed by this cryptid menace. Mutilated animals left in bloody heaps, human bodies torn limb from limb. As the sun sank lower behind the horizon, I followed Jack and a handful of townsfolk to a small chapel hidden among trees on the edge of town. Flickering candlelight cast eerie shadows on their faces as they disclosed stories passed down for generations about this mysterious creature, tales they had kept secret for fear of retaliation from the beast itself. Skinwalkers used to be shamans practicing the dark arts, Jack explained gravely. Driven by greed or rage, these once human beings transform themselves into monsters capable of unspeakable horrors. They've been known to disguise themselves as familiar animals or even humans to deceive and lure their prey. As the unsettling truths unfolded about the creature that had pursued me, I couldn't help but notice how the people in the chapel gathered closer together for comfort. Jack assured us that while skinwalkers were incredibly dangerous, they had been driven away before by the concerted efforts of the townsfolk and a unified front against their unthinkable power. The group devised a plan to force the skinwalker from its hiding place and confront it using ancient rituals and sacred weapons. Jack spoke with determination and resolve, instilling a sense of courage in those who listened. Time was of the essence, and we marched together back into the forest under the shivering light of a crescent moon. Guided by intuition and necessity, Jack led us to what he believed was the creature's lair, a decrepit shack obscured by an unnatural darkness. Holding our collective breaths, we performed blessings and held our weapons out in anticipation. The night was charged with palpable tension as an unnerving silence suffocated the area around us. We waited for what felt like hours until, without warning, a menacing roar shattered the stillness. The skinwalker emerged from its den, its misshapen form obscured by shadows, making it near impossible to accurately describe. We stood our ground hearts thundering in our chests as adrenaline battled fear. Despite all odds and propelled by sheer desperation, we faced the malicious force that threatened everything we knew. The ordeal raged throughout that horrifying night, terrified screams pierced through cruel snarls, and ancient rites clashed with hateful fury. Dawn broke over a scene of immense carnage but bittersweet victory, the skinwalker had fled into its dark realm once more, vanquished for now. The ordeal was over, and yet deep down I knew it didn't mean an end to the creature's terror. True evil can never be completely eradicated, but the knowledge that in our deepest moments of fear we possessed the strength to confront it brought a glimmer of hope. The town began to rebuild with scars healing and memories fading over time as once again life moved on. But was it truly over? Every unnatural sound or shadow shifting in the night's embrace reminded us of that monstrous face lurking beyond the edge of our world and sanity, waiting for its chance to return. 
and so we lived trapped between respite and fear, uncertain of what the future would bring but ready to face whatever darkness lay ahead. It was an ungodly afternoon when I first encountered the harrowing screeches echoing throughout the barren landscape surrounding my home, situated in the remote regions of rural Nevada. My life, once filled with good fortune, close friends, and a warm sense of belonging, had long spiraled downward into a lonely existence plagued by a constant sense of unease and paranoia. Little did I know that fateful day would mark the beginning of an unimaginable nightmare. People often disconnect from ordinary life when faced with extreme circumstances. But I, being someone who prided myself on my unwavering rationality, could not accept the truth that gradually unfolded before me. The dedication I showed in trying to ignore the sinister force that plagued my reality was admirable but futile. As the horrifying incidents began to escalate, so did my determination to remain grounded in logic. Late one night, as I was making my way back home after spending hours reading at a local library, I caught a glimpse of something moving nearby, an eerie figure skulking in the shadows just beyond the glow of dim streetlights. Though it vanished as suddenly as it appeared, it left me with goosebumps and an overwhelming feeling of dread that lingered even as I locked the door behind me. Over time, these unnerving encounters became increasingly frequent and menacing. Late night walks became dangerous endeavors where shadows seemed to come alive, poised to strike but never quite revealing their origin. Strangers whispered fearfully about the mysterious sickness spreading like wildfire among local livestock but refused to speak at length about the possible source of their suffering. More disturbing still were the muffled cries and agonizing screams that drifted through the night's air from neighboring houses, ones that authorities could never quite explain or adequately address. The streets emptied as people locked their doors tight and kept their fears hidden away, a shared burden carried by those who dared not speak its name. One night, after an arduous debate with myself and a couple of drinks to steady my nerves, I finally decided to confront whatever was stalking the streets of my once peaceful community. I didn't give voice to my thoughts or share them with anyone else. But an unspoken understanding lingered among troubled individuals in my life who turned their gazes away when the topic of the assault on our town arose. I stepped outside and walked down my driveway, sweat beginning to beat on my brow despite the chill in the night air. The once comforting glow of streetlights now cast sinister shadows as they battle with darkness. I had been walking for what felt like hours and the events that followed blurred together in a whirlwind of panic and survival instinct. In an instant, it was no longer skulking in the shadows but standing before me in all its terrifying glory. A twisted mockery of human form yet an embodiment of malice, straining the limits of my disbelief. It moved toward me as my legs refused to carry me away from the threat. My mind struggled to comprehend the monstrosity before me. Its twisted limbs and distorted facial features seemed to stretch, bend, and contort as if nothing could contain the malevolence they held within. I knew then that escape was my only option. As I tried to force my legs to move, a neighboring door swung open, revealing a man named Mark who was known around town. He shouted at the creature and waved a shotgun in its direction. The sudden noise and appearance of this new figure caught the monster's attention, pulling its focus away from me for a moment. Mark fired two shots toward the beast, each one making contact but not inflicting enough damage to stop it. However, it was enough to buy some time as the skinwalker became more cautious noting the weapon that was now aimed at it. 
Seizing this opportunity, I bolted toward my house without looking back. My heart was pounding in my ears as I sprinted through my front door and locked it behind me. The entire house shook as the creatures and raged howls echoed throughout the quiet night. As I tried to catch my breath and gather myself, I heard Mark outside yelling for help as many people started gathering around his porch. From an upstairs window, I saw Mark speak with a police officer who had arrived on scene. What just happened? asked one of the neighbors who had come outside. I fired at that thing, Mark replied visibly shaken. I've heard stories about these creatures. Skinwalkers, they're called. The gathered bystanders began discussing what Mark had just shared amongst themselves with a mix of skepticism and curiosity in their voices. I watched as the police officer took Mark's statement and then moved on to others who had witnessed some part of what happened that night. The whole neighborhood knew something unnatural had occurred. Hours passed by as if they were mere minutes while everyone accounted for their experience with this mysterious beast, and soon enough, the police decided that the threat had passed. It seemed like the skinwalker had retreated, at least for now. In the days that passed, whispers of the vicious encounter spread throughout the town, the question on everyone's lips was whether it would return to seek out its next unfortunate victim or if perhaps it was hiding secretly within our own community. People started to question all that they knew and doubt those they once trusted. The monster became not only a lurking presence but a force that divided and tainted friendships or family bonds. The skinwalker terrorized the town in ways other than just that first reported encounter. The nightmarish memories replayed in my mind, leaving me constantly on edge, even though there were no fresh signs of that monstrous being. It was two days later that the final twist of this tale came to light. A hunter had discovered some unusual footprints in a nearby forest which led him to uncover the body of an old man who appeared to have taken his own life. There was no sign as to how he had done so without leaving any trace behind, but something told us this man had been involved in awakening the bitter spirit within the skinwalker. Now that we were left to wonder if the creature would ever return, a feeling cloaked in both fear and mystery shadowed our every movement. Each dark alleyway and shadowed corner held potential threats we couldn't predict or prepare for. With no way of knowing whether this tale was truly over or if it was just beginning, we locked our doors tight each night and lived our lives cautiously. And just like that, our small town was changed forever by something more sinister and unexplainable than any of us dared imagine. That's when we all realize that some things should never be uncovered. They only serve to destroy the peace and trust once enjoyed by those unfortunate enough to be a part of such terrible events. All we can do is continue onward with the knowledge that something this wicked might just be a breath away at all times. But in the end, we must endure, knowing that terror may lie in wait, even within our own fair town. I was just sipping my lukewarm cup of instant coffee and going through my morning ritual when a sudden report from the commanding officer made me freeze in mid-sip. Apparently, something went terribly wrong during a secret military operation in the Alaskan wilderness. I couldn't help but remember that today, December 12th, it was exactly five years since I had joined the United States Army. I never imagined experiencing something like this. Brace yourselves, soldiers, the officer warned gravely. We've got a Class A situation on our hands. Murmurs of disbelief and shock emanated throughout the room as my fellow soldiers exchanged puzzled glances. 
We were quickly briefed on the specifics. Operation Kodiak Bleak had turned unexpectedly gruesome. As part of the operation, we were tasked with retrieving a hidden stash of classified documents from an abandoned, archaic government facility deep within Alaska's unforgiving terrain. Initially, it was thought that inclement weather would be our biggest foe. However, that assumption couldn't have been further from the truth. The first indication that something wasn't right came from tattered audio transmissions containing primeval growls and blood-curdling screams. The recon team sent an earlier never reported back. Instead, we found their mutilated bodies scattered near the facility entrance. Curiously enough, local legends kept mentioning a menacing creature known as Nalusa Chito lingering deep in these woods labeled merely as fiction until now. Its visage was said to strike fear into one's soul, razor-sharp teeth lining an elongated snout dripping with dark blood, eyes so vile they could send a shudder down the spine of even the most hardened men. As we scoured the remnants of what once used to be a highly guarded establishment, our hearts hammered against our ribs. Shadows danced on every wall, seemingly mocking us as we cautiously treaded along the darkened corridors with flashlights in one hand and rifles securely gripped in the other. Not much of a rescue mission. A fellow soldier named Tyler muttered softly. More like a suicide mission. A sudden, distant growl quickly transformed Tyler's morose jests into unfathomable dread. We followed protocol to the letter. Backup teams had been contacted, and we were advised to hold our ground until reinforcements could arrive. Despite that assurance, our hearts swelled with uneasiness as the creature's guttural noises drew ever closer. Just as Tyler and I turned to shuffle back toward the group, we glimpsed an unspeakable horror clinging to the ceiling like a grotesque spider. The creature's ghastly eyes locked onto ours as it bared its teeth, soaked in the darkness of death. Though every ounce of our senses screamed for us to retreat, our bodies refused to heed their call, frozen by pure terror. A terrified scream pierced through the suffocating silence, emanating from one of our comrades who stood paralyzed mere feet away from the malicious beast we now faced. Before any of us could react or reach for our weapons, it lunged at him with disquieting agility, leaving a smear of gore in its wake. Jackson! No! Tyler cried hoarsely as he fired at the putrid mass of muscle and sinew. His aim was true, but the bullets seemed to merely phase through it, leaving no visible harm. Unspeakable panic coursed through our veins as we quickly realized that conventional means would not be enough against this twisted embodiment of nightmares. We scrambled for any plan that dared dance on the precipice of rational thought, anything that would ensure survival against this beast born from folklore's darkest pits. The sight of its elongated talons sinking mercilessly into Jackson's flesh sent shivers down my spine. Painting my resolve with cold determination, I forced my legs to move, inadvertently stepping on a broken pipe. My eyes widened in realization as I staggered towards Tyler, my voice hoarse but firm. Tyler! Lead it under the exposed pipes! Our once visceral fear seemed to dissipate as we charged desperately towards the interconnected network of twisted metal pipes. With its guttural roars echoing through the facility, that malignant creature pursued us relentlessly, flashes of darkness barely visible as it wove daringly close to our every step. With our enemy drawing near, I nodded at Tyler to start the hazards as I rushed ahead to the exit. As we primed for action, the remaining pipes were beginning to hiss and rattle, signaling the onset of our improvised trap. As I stumbled through the maze of pipes, my heart thumped wildly in my chest. The creature's monstrous form grew ever closer, 
its blood-curdling cries punctuating the tense silence. I was well aware of the risk we had taken in confronting this ancient beast called the Wendigo, a creature born from darkness, greed, and human cannibalism. It had once been a man but now fed on the flesh of our kind. I had recognized it from old stories passed down by the locals we encountered during our travels in these cold northern lands. With sweat trickling down my forehead, I gasped for air as I caught sight of Tyler up ahead at the control panel. He gave me a small nod, indicating everything was set. The Wendigo continued its pursuit, oblivious to what fate had in store. Now. I bellowed to Tyler, who threw the lever with all his might. The maze of pipes burst to life in an instant as high-pressure jets of steam sprayed out from every conceivable angle. The Wendigo screeched in agony as it found itself assaulted by blistering hot steam that seared its darkened flesh and tore through bone. The sound it made was horrendous a harsh cacophony between howling wind and guttural despair. It thrashed wildly against the relentless jets of steam, seeking freedom and escape from its torturous prison among the pipes. Each desperate movement only seemed to bring it more pain as its demonic body rapidly succumbed to grievous injuries and unbearable heat. Meanwhile, Tyler and I huddled against the wall nearby watching breathlessly as the Wendigo writhed under nature's relentless, scorching embrace. Our hearts pounded like war drums in our chests. A strange mix of anticipation and apprehension suffused us with emotion that words could hardly describe. A few more tense moments passed before, at long last, the creature finally succumbed body and soul to the steam's intense fury. From what we could tell, it looked like it was transforming back into the lifeless form of a man, perhaps the person it had once been before betrayal and hunger tainted its heart beyond redemption. But even though I wanted to feel relief that this nightmare was over, that we had somehow survived, I couldn't shake the eerie feeling slithering down my spine. My gut told me our brush with darkness hadn't reached its end, at least not yet. No, in fact, it was merely the beginning, as we had now crossed paths with the Wendigo twice. Wordlessly, Tyler and I picked ourselves up from the cold, damp floor of the facility. We were battered and bruised but alive, a truth we both knew couldn't be celebrated just yet. As we left the scene of our harrowing encounter behind us, time itself seemed to take an ominous shift as though the Wendigo's rage had left a palpable imprint on reality itself. It wasn't until weeks later, when Tyler called me late at night, that I began to see pieces of this cryptic puzzle fall into place. His strained and somber voice stuck a chilling chord in my heart. It's happening again, Tyler whispered over the phone, just as thunder cracked in the distance. I found another one yesterday evening, a mutilated body deep in the woods. Needless to say, I didn't sleep that night. We had slain one Wendigo, yes. But had our actions only opened a door for another? Would darkness follow us wherever we went? And were we doomed to confront these fearsome creatures again and again, like Sisyphus rolling his cursed boulder uphill? It was then that I understood that this hellish story would never truly end. It would only change, adapting and morphing into something new each time we dared to pull back the curtain of night and confront the terrors that lurked within. The Wendigo legend might have begun with this creature we had faced, but it would not end with it. And as long as darkness remained in the hearts of men, either would our nightmare. Sirens blared in the distance as I lounged on the porch, exchanging jokes with my cousin, Rexton Draycourt. 
It was a Saturday afternoon, and we just polished off a plate of barbecue sliders, feeling those lazy vibes you get after being stuffed to the brim with delicious, greasy grub. The key to a perfect cheeseburger, Rexton mused, is a blend of 80% chuck and 20% sirloin. That's the sweet spot right there. In between chuckles, I responded. I don't know how I survived without your culinary expertise, man. As our laughter subsided, we noticed a strange movement on the edge of the street. Someone was stumbling along the sidewalk, their gait awkward and jerky. From this distance, it wasn't clear whether they were drunk or injured. Rexton squinted his eyes. Do you see that? Kinda spooky, huh? Yeah, I muttered. Gradually, our light-hearted banter transitioned into an uneasy silence as we watched the figure draw nearer. The man, if you could call him that, came into full view as he shuffled unevenly toward us. His face was contorted in a twisted expression of pure agony, his eyes rolling back into his head as thick drool poured from his mouth. He dragged one foot lifelessly behind him, leaving a trail of crimson in his wake. What on earth? Rexton mumbled before quickly grabbing his phone. I'm calling 911. I nodded in agreement but couldn't take my eyes off the horrific scene unfolding before us. The disheveled man drew closer with every passing second. Instinctively, I attempted to shield Rexton from potential danger while he explained the dire situation to the police. Suddenly overcome by primal urgency and fear, I shouted at the stranger, Hey! You need to stay back, all right? We've called for help, but you need to stay away until it arrives. Something about this person felt deeply unnerving, even from a distance. But my warning fell on deaf ears. The man's erratic movements did nothing to prompt a response or even acknowledgement of my words. In a desperate attempt to protect us, I grabbed an aluminum baseball bat from inside the house, readying myself for the worst. As the stranger drew nearer, I noticed his pallid skin stretched taut over jetting bones. His eyes had an eerie, furrowed glare that sent shivers up my spine. This was no ordinary human being. Rexton finished speaking with the dispatcher and looked back at me. They said help is on the way. But something feels off about this whole situation. Yeah, I whispered, a pit forming in my stomach. This is anything but normal. The man continued to thread closer, completely ignoring the blood that seeped from somewhere within his tattered clothes. Our fear grew as we realized his intentions were far from benign. I gripped the bat tighter in my hands preparing for whatever terrifying confrontation awaited us. There was no way out now. We had to stand our ground against whatever this thing truly was. As the monstrous figure continued its sluggish pursuit towards us, I glanced over at Rexton and saw equal parts determination and terror reflected in his eyes. We readied ourselves for what may be our final stand this largely undefinable stranger who threatened our very existence. And yet, just as we braced for impact, the man abruptly stopped in his tracks, just mere inches away from us. My heart pounded in my chest as I stared at him, gripping the baseball bat tightly in my sweaty palms. Rexton stood beside me, his eyes darting between the stranger and the approaching sirens. What do you want? I shouted at him, my voice wavering with fear. He only groaned in response, a guttural, inhuman sound that chilled me to the core. Suddenly, the bloody man lunged forward with an aggressive snarl, causing me to swing the bat in self-defense. With a sickening thud, I struck the side of his head. He crumpled onto our lawn, but he was far from defeated. 
In an instant, he was back on his feet with an unnatural speed. What I saw horrified me beyond words. The area where I had hit this monstrous being was rapidly healing itself, with skin and bones reforming before our very eyes. This wasn't human. It couldn't be. I panicked and swung once more, this time striking him square in the chest as Rexton joined my initiative by grabbing a plank of wood from our unfinished fence construction. But again, despite his injuries, he did not seem phased as his body healed unnaturally fast. Suddenly, the sirens reached their peak volume. Flashing lights and bellowing voices filled the air around us as police cars skidded to a stop nearby. The officers clambered out of their vehicles and hurried toward us. Step back! One yelled as they approached the terrifying figure menacingly standing between Rexton and me. Rexton whispered to me urgently, Do you think they know what's going on? Doubt nod at every corner of my thoughts. It seemed impossible that anyone could be fully prepared for what we were up against. The officers encircled the supernatural figure and tasered him without warning. He convulsed under the combined assault of multiple tasers, but moments later, his body seemed to regain control, standing taller and even more menacing with every second. Rexton and I exchanged horrified looks as the policemen struggled to subdue the seemingly indestructible monster before us. It seemed like hours but was probably only minutes when one officer announced over his radio that they needed backup, something stronger than tasers. I glanced at my cousin, who was now trembling with fear. I knew that this nightmare was far from over. As firefighters and paramedics arrived on the scene, I recounted our harrowing encounter to a detective, who listened intently. Meanwhile, other police officers managed to temporarily immobilize this horrific antagonist using tranquilizing darts meant for large animals, though we all worried that it would not be enough. As Rexton and I returned to our home with bloodshot eyes and shaking hands, we swore never to speak of this terrifying day again. The creature, whatever it was, had been detained temporarily, but given its inhuman ability to heal and withstand harm, we couldn't shake the feeling that this nightmare was only beginning. In an eerie silence that lingered long after emergency personnel left our street, Rexton turned to me with a defeated expression. What do you think that thing was? I don't know, I whispered, my voice barely audible. But now that it's found us, it won't stop until it gets what it wants. Our eyes met in understanding as we vowed to protect each other no matter what. This malevolent entity would continue stalking us until its agenda was fulfilled, and if letting it succeed was not an option, we had no choice but to prepare ourselves for the dreadful days ahead. I was on my way back to the depot after a long day of deliveries when I decided to pull over at a rest stop for a quick snack and to stretch my legs. Finding a trucker-friendly place was always a fun challenge, but this time, I found a cozy little spot just off the interstate called Mike's Truck Stop and Grill. It didn't seem too busy, so I figured now would be as good a time as any to take a break. After grabbing a greasy cheeseburger and finishing it in record time, I stepped outside for some fresh air. The sun was setting, casting deep orange and purple hues across the western horizon. Finishing up a phone call with my wife, I could feel my legs loosen as I enjoyed the moment of tranquility. I have to make the most of these little breaks between runs, I remember thinking. A windblown newspaper skipped across the parking lot like tumbleweed, attracting my attention briefly before it disappeared into an open gully. 
The air carried an unsettling chill that made me shudder. Suddenly feeling compelled to hit the road again, I wished my wife well and headed back to my rig. As I climbed back into my truck's cab, I caught sight of something unusual. A dust-covered old van with one headlight flickering weakly on its hood. The van appeared to be straight out of some twisted nostalgia trip from the 70s. Its dirty windows obscured any view inside, but overall, it seemed harmless enough. Rolling out onto the highway once more, there was only one other vehicle. Sure enough, it was that creepy old van keeping pace alongside me. We continued like this for miles until the van began lagging behind ever so slightly before speeding up again. With each cycle, they inched closer until they were mere inches from my side mirror. What is this guy's problem? I muttered beneath my breath, gripping the wheel tight as annoyance quickly turned to anxiety. Frustration welled up inside me as I attempted to outrun them but they matched my acceleration perfectly, my skepticism vanishing as the situation began to truly feel dangerous. Suddenly, a burst of static cut through the soft hum of the radio station I had been listening to. A distorted voice crackled across the waves. Nice evening for a race, huh? My heart raced as I realized that my scrutiny wasn't misplaced. Desperate to be free of this unnerving driver and regain control, I attempted another burst of speed despite knowing it would do no good. The van's grating laughter echoed in mockery over the radio like a taunting shadow. All right, all right, the voice said. Since you don't want to play, here's a joke for you. What's got one broken headlight and is about to make your life miserable? Before I could process what was happening or even contemplate responding, something slammed into the side of my truck with enough force that it veered dangerously off course. It was all I could do to avoid careening into oncoming traffic or hurtling off the highway altogether. Breathing heavily as terror settled in, I glanced across at the van just in time to see a twisted grin staring back at me from their driver's seat a face devoid of any further identifying features but seething with unadulterated malice. I knew this was far from over, and my thoughts raced through potential plans, weighing each option and each possible escape from this relentless tormentor. But in that moment, there was no room for wit, humor, or lightheartedness only pure gut-wrenching apprehension as an unknown nemesis had made its presence known. As we continued down this dark stretch of highway, with every mile adding weariness to our dance of death, I was left with one thing, an impossible choice between standing my ground and fighting against the nightmare beside me or relenting to the fear that gripped my heart. And as those two paths loomed before me, the horror of it all twisted tighter and tighter, and snaring me within its grasp. No matter which I chose, surely this journey had changed all that I had once known, and one thing was certain, there would be no easy endings on this forsaken road to darkness. With no other choice, I picked up the radio and replied to the mocking voice, Who are you, and what do you want from me? The laughter died down, replaced by a predatory grin. My name's Tony, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that you're going to play my game. What game, Tony? I asked, my voice wavering. I'll ask you a few questions. Get em right, and I might let you live. We'll see how it goes, he said with a hint of menace. Realizing this madman was all too real and that I had no choice but to play along, I steeled myself for the bizarre interrogation to come. All right, I replied tersely. Ask your questions. First question, when was the last time you saw your family? The question struck me as strange. 
Exactly what my family had to do with our high-speed duel on this desolate highway was unclear. As I racked my brain to recall my answer, something shattered the night's eerie silence. The sound of speeding cars, followed by a cacophony of sirens in the distance. Thinking quickly, I seized on the opportunity presented by our impending audience. You know what, Tony? You're right. My last visit to see my family was just today. I lied through clenched teeth, knowing full well that any true memories of them were blurred behind countless miles spent hauling cargo and late-night phone calls. Tony scoffed in disbelief before barking out his next question. Unknowingly caught in my deception already, though, he was tossed off balance just enough for me to claw back some semblance of control on this hellish track. The chase continued as state troopers began closing in, their flashing lights illuminating our twisted dance through the darkness. Desperation set in as we careened onward. Who would falter first? With an inexorable sense of impending doom, I caught sight of a sharp turn up ahead. Risking a gambit that could potentially spell my end, I slammed the brake and swerved onto a hidden side road. Tony's van shot past me as confusion muddied his typically steadfast pursuit. As I guided my rig along this new path, I finally regained contact with my wife through my phone. Sobbing and gasping, she relayed the terrifying news that an unhinged admirer named Tony had been stalking her for months, tracking our calls in his bizarre fixation and exacting revenge on me, his newfound rival. With renewed urgency and insight into the twisted mind gleefully tormenting me, I found resolve alongside my fellow riders police lights echoing off the trees that lined our makeshift route. Though unfamiliar territory for all involved, we barreled down that side road in hopes of catching our unseen tormentor before he left our grasp once more. In the darkness, we found Tony's van pulled over to the side. Guns drawn, officers approached warily, yet as they yanked open the rusty door, no one was there. Vanished like breath on a mirror, both Tony and his one-eyed van remained tantalizingly out of reach. The hunt for Tony seemed to stretch on for days. However, in reality, it was little more than a few fleeting hours before law enforcement personnel reluctantly called off their search. Despite their best efforts and those of my family, who were now under round-the-clock protection, our sinister pursuer remained at large. Though we never found out who or what Tony did afterward that night, nor why he chose me as his twisted target, his twisted game continues to haunt us. Both those who shared such horrifying experiences on those darkened highways and those who tirelessly pursued him into obscurity. The rising sun may have restored some semblance of order and light to the world, but its impotent rays could not pierce the darkness enshrouding our souls. And so, while the ghost of Tony's malevolent laugh may have dissolved into little more than an unsettling memory, the scars he left remain eternal, serving as an inescapable reminder that evil lurks within even the most mundane corners of our lives. I was sitting at a diner with my colleagues, joking around and discussing our latest mission. It was the evening of August 30th in Redding, California, and we were all trying to unwind over a late dinner. My name is Kellen Armistead, a CIA operative who has been working on a covert team since I was 22, nine long years. I'll spare you the details of my background. I grew up in a difficult family situation and found solace in my work. Most of the time, it wasn't anything like movies show, the killing, the spy chases, that was Hollywood talking. It was more about observing, blending in, 
and gathering information, but sometimes things got messy, very messy. As we were finishing up our meals and laughing at a particularly crude joke by my friend Marcus, we noticed something strange happening outside. Police cruisers were speeding towards some location further down the street. Now usually, we wouldn't bother with local activities and have no jurisdiction in civil matters. But that night, we felt restless and decided to check it out, in hindsight, not the smartest idea. We told the waitress to pack up our leftovers and stepped outside into the cool night air. Following the direction of the police sirens, we walked several blocks until we heard a cacophony of gunshots coming from an alleyway. A deep sense of dread settled within me as my instincts kicked in. It was time to be on high alert. We crept behind parked cars and made our way closer to the source of the commotion, only to find a grisly scene. Strewn all across the pavement lay torn clothes covered in blood, along with an assortment of severed limbs. I felt sick looking at it, but we had work to do. As we searched for any clues or survivors, Sharon, our team's tech expert, noticed something even more sinister. There were massive claw marks on some of the bodies, the presence of something not human responsible for this carnage. My mind raced. Mythical creatures weren't part of my job description. But it could have been a CIA experiment gone wrong. We needed answers. We decided to split up and gather information. Sharon took off in one direction, Marcus in another, and I went down the alley toward the marks. As I moved deeper into the darkness, I tripped over something. I braced for impact, only to be caught in a net trap. Swinging helplessly in midair, my senses heightened by fear and confusion, I heard a faint growl nearby. It was unnatural, and every cell in my body screamed to get away from it. Suddenly, the air became dense with an unbearable stench, like burning rubber mixed with rotting meat. A low growl grew louder as unimaginable terror coursed through me. Out of nowhere, an unclear figure appeared inches away from me. It had the tendencies of an animal, but it stood on two legs, and its claws were as sharp as a scalpel, leaving no doubt about its capacity for destruction. A scream lodged in my throat. The creature didn't seem natural or man-made, something far more sinister. Its eyes then locked onto mine, sharp like a predator's gaze, and I could see the intelligence behind them. This creature was no mindless beast, it had a plan. It stared at me for what seemed like an eternity but was probably just a few minutes, scrutinizing my face perhaps trying to understand who I was. Suddenly, Marcus and Sharon appeared in the alleyway, weapons drawn. But the creature vanished in a split second, faster than anything I'd ever seen. We regrouped and decided to return to our hotel to arm ourselves properly. We didn't know what this thing was, but we knew it wasn't something we could handle with our regular gear. The next day, after researching unexplained disappearances and brutal attacks in the area, we found mention of a creature referred to only as the Gashidakuro, an ancient being thought to be responsible for countless deaths and mutilations over the centuries. Connected to various mythologies around the globe, it had different names and descriptions, but its modus operandi remained constant swift savagery leaving a trail of horror. Around 10 p.m. that same night, armed with high-powered rifles and other equipment designed to combat supernatural threats while still being sensible enough for believable use against creatures or criminals alike, we set off for the alley again, hoping to draw out the Gashidakuro. As we moved cautiously through that godforsaken alleyway where I had first encountered the creature, a voice echoed through the darkness. A man, 
one of our CIA colleagues, was slumped against a dumpster, his clothes torn and his face pale. He whispered urgently that he'd been attacked by some kind of monster but managed to hide as soon as he saw us approaching. Handing me a piece of paper from his pocket, he gasped. This is what you need to know about that thing. A surge of pain contorted his expression before his eyes rolled back into his head, and just like that, he was gone. We immediately checked the piece of paper. There, in cramped handwriting, was information regarding the Gashidakuro's origin. It had once been a man, a powerful sorcerer who had made a sinister pact to gain wealth and eternal life. Upon breaking the pact, he was cursed to roam the earth as a monstrous creature, feeding on human flesh and seeking vengeance. Knowing the creature's origins made it no less dangerous, but at least we knew its anger and hatred were focused on the descendants of those who'd broken the pact. In fact, a member of our team, Sharon, was distantly connected to this lineage, it seemed the Gashidakuro had been tracking us because of her. We decided to use Sharon as bait while Marcus and I hid, prepared to strike when the creature attacked. And then it came, its unnatural growl echoing through the alley once more, and lunged toward her with terrifying speed. Squeezing the trigger of my high-powered rifle, my fingers throbbed from the recoil as Marcus joined me in unloading round after round on the Gashidakuro. It screeched and convulsed in agony but refused to give up, its impenetrable, dark eyes set on devouring Sharon. Suddenly, there was a thunderous crash, as if someone had dropped an anvil from above. Electricity surged outward from where Sharon stood the air crackling and alive with power. The creature writhed in pain before vanishing into thin air, leaving behind nothing but scorched concrete where it once stood. Our connection to the mythical being was severed that night. The creature won't be back any time soon. It seems we underestimated just how strong our team could be, even when faced with unknown threats. It was the kind of weekend that made you want to just sleep in and lounge around the house. It happened a couple of years ago, right around the time my brother, Jerry, decided that he wanted to play the role of the local bad boy. At this point in my life, I was only really interested in spending time with my buddies, watching TV shows, or playing video games. It was Saturday afternoon when Jerry returned from his typical day of cavorting with the town misfits and suggested we head out to an abandoned farmhouse just outside our suburban neighborhood in Illinois. There were always whispers about that place being cursed. Around here, it seems every innocent-looking structure has its fair share of gory tales attached to it. But as skeptical teenagers, we didn't pay any heed to those stories. As we approached the dilapidated farmhouse, I figured it was going to be a harmless misadventure, another story for us to tell at school. Little did I know how wrong that assumption would be. The sun started to dip below the horizon, painting the sky orange and pink as we stepped into the creaking building. The group we were with, Jerry's friends, didn't have much on their minds except for thoughts of booze and other illicit substances. But as they partied and laughed away inside that grimy old house, I noticed something out by the deserted fields. In the distance stood what appeared to be a large, canine-like figure devouring something it had caught. Curious but horror-stricken, I tried my best to convince Jerry's friends' stoner minds that something bizarre was happening. Eventually, Tom, a guy who's always been kind of an older brother figure in our little gang, agreed to check out what I'd seen earlier. Perhaps he could suppress his fears better than me, 
But isn't it funny how often bravery is just another form of stupidity? We crept our way out, following the direction I had spotted the creature or animal, whatever it was. As we reached the edge of the field, we noticed a mutilated deer in a pool of blood. It was partially eaten, and while unsettling, the sight alone didn't really freak us out. Then we noticed the footprints, circular impressions with massive claws that tore through mud and gravel alike. Assuming it was some massive bear, we thought it best to head back to, holy shit. Suddenly, an ear-shattering howl came from somewhere around us. The sound sent shivers down my spine. It felt like a thousand needles piercing my soul. Before I could even wrap my head around what was happening, I heard a symphony of gut-wrenching snarls closing in on us. As adrenaline kicked in, Tom and I sprinted back to the farmhouse, alerting Jerry that something was wrong. The group sobered up real quick when they saw our ashen faces and wide eyes. In just a matter of minutes, all the gloves were off. I told you! It's a fucking werewolf or something! One guy shouted as we scrambled for anything that could pass as a weapon. The claws of whatever or whoever it was scraped against wood panes and bricks as it circled the farmhouse, daring us inside to abandon our safe haven. Lumbering howls contrasted with hushed cries as we weighed our limited options. Seconds felt like hours with every shallow breath or gnaw of fear-filled teeth upon your tongue. As soon as we realized the gravity of the situation, we decided we needed a plan to escape this living nightmare. I could barely think straight, while the horrifying sounds of the creature's snarls grew closer. Sarah, one of Jerry's friends who happened to be with us that night, came up with an idea. Let's set a trap, she whispered. We can use the deer's remains as bait and create a diversion. None of us had a better suggestion so we agreed reluctantly. We placed the deer remains on one side of the farmhouse and assigned Johnny, another friend, to light an old kerosene lantern nearby. The flickering light cast eerie shadows on the walls, only adding to our shared panic. Then each one of us took whatever makeshift weapon we could find, wooden planks with rusted nails, broken glass bottles, even an old crowbar ready to defend ourselves in case all hell broke loose. The time was around 9.47 p.m., and I remember wishing that we could turn back time and erase our stupidity forever coming to this cursed place. The howling and snarling grew louder as the monster approached. What I saw next made my skin crawl. It had unnaturally large muscles towering over us at probably over seven feet tall and dripping with gore from its latest meal. Its eyes gleamed with a sinister bloodlust. It was more intelligent than any regular creature had any right to be. Run! I shouted as Johnny threw the burning lantern at the beast. Flames enveloped it for a brief moment, eliciting a tormented roar from within. We scattered in different directions and met at an agreed-upon rendezvous spot about half a mile away from the farmhouse. Once we regrouped and made sure everyone was accounted for, we decided to call 911, but not before coming up with a story that wouldn't make us sound completely insane. We agreed that we would tell the police that a beastly maniac, a serial killer, would explain the monstrous scratches on the house and the deer's mangled state. The authorities reached the location at 10.24 p.m., guns drawn, and were searching for the so-called deranged murderer. They found nothing but blood and wreckage, with no trace of our terrifying foe. Afterward, they dismissed it as a prank or perhaps the work of an oddly vicious animal. Questions came our way, but eventually, we were sent home safe. We never mentioned that night to anyone else. We each buried our memories deep within ourselves, 
too afraid to relive those moments. Two days after that encounter, I discovered a peculiar scraping noise outside my window in the middle of the night. Breathing heavily, scared to move even an inch, I peeked at the shadows dancing on the wall as if they were eating away at reality itself. While it could be my mind playing tricks because of what transpired recently, something tells me it isn't over. Those cruel growls that drift outside on moonlit nights remind me to never forget or underestimate what terror hides in dark corners. We may have survived once by sheer luck and determination, but there's always a gnawing fear at the back of each one of us who faced that gruesome creature in that dilapidated farmhouse nightmare. And as days go by and strange scratching continues here and there around town, or perhaps only in our imaginations, I worry if our past monsters will ever truly be laid to rest. I was sipping my whiskey sour while joking with my hunting buddies at the Black Deer, the local dive bar in Winchester, between two exhilarating elk hunts the previous day and tomorrow's hunting plans. My trophy room at home already displayed numerous cryptid kills, a testament to my significant experience as a seasoned monster hunter. Though most folks don't believe in cryptids or think of them as mere folklore, I knew better. I had my share of encounters. Nearby, a group of college students spoke in hushed tones about some gruesome event that had taken place in the nearby Shenandoah National Forest. When they mentioned something shocking about it, naturally it piqued my interest. They talked about shredded animals found on forest trails, streams running red with blood, and peculiar half-human half-beast footprints all over the place, their voices trembling with fear. My annoyance at missing the punchline to Dave's raccoon joke has now morphed into curiosity. I needed to find out what was happening over there. Despite my desire to enjoy a peaceful drink and some laughs with friends, a deeper yearning for truth scratched within me. The following morning, our hunting team decided to take a detour into the heart of Shenandoah National Forest. After walking deeper than we had originally intended, hunger and exhaustion were creeping up on us, as was an unnerving sense of impending dread mixed with curiosity. We stumbled upon a ravine littered with bones picked clean. Bizarre markings etched into tree trunks caught our attention. The hairs on the back of our necks stood up like soldiers on guard duty when we heard frantic shrieks from distressed animals nearby. Unwilling to wait for whatever caused this chaos to stumble upon us blindsided, we cautiously sneaked forward, the ground softened by leaves, atop some rocky outcrop overgrown with kudzu vines overlooking the valley below. Our initial amusement at the students' stories transformed into a shared sense of unease. It was there that we saw it. A creature like none I had ever encountered in any cryptid hunting operation, relentless, brutal, and seemingly driven by pure malevolence. Its body, humanoid yet primal, boasted a dense coating of musky fur and elongated limbs capped with razor-sharp claws that gouged the earth with each massive stride. The creature tore into a deer carcass with a savage voracity that churned my stomach. The gore sprayed in every direction as tissue ripped from bones like wet paper. Its eyes were pools of inscrutable blackness, seeming to reflect nothing but an abyss of loathing and pain. As we watched this abomination revel in its feast, I couldn't help but recall those terrified college students back at the bar. This beast, this monster, transcended every cryptid horror story they had whispered about. Their nightmares paled in comparison to what we were witnessing. Once our initial shock wore off, I knew we had to make a decision, 
Did we risk our lives to face this demonic menace head-on or allow its rampage to continue unchecked? As if sensing our indecision, the beast suddenly paused, sniffed the air, and fixed us with its dead-eyed gaze. In the blink of an eye, the creature sprang towards us, propelled by primal fury. With its claws outstretched and razor teeth bared, we braced ourselves for the impending onslaught. Just at that moment, one of my buddies, whose survival instincts kicked in, fired a shot directly into the beast's gaping maw. The bullet barely slowed it down, but the noise and impact were just enough to give us a fighting chance. We scrambled away as fast as our legs would carry us, sprinting through the dense forest as leaves slapped our faces and branches clawed at our clothes. The creature was right on our heels. Its gut-wrenching snarls echoed through the trees like hell's own growls. As coincidence would have it, we stumbled upon an old abandoned cabin while trying to escape. Without hesitation, my team and I dashed inside and slammed the door shut. The creature slammed its massive frame against the wooden barricade, each deafening thud splintering the wood a little bit more. Desperate to protect ourselves from this unstoppable force of nature, we quickly scavenged the cabin for weapons. To our luck, our frantic search yielded some hunting rifles and ammunition that had been left behind by previous occupants. We positioned ourselves near the creaky door for an ambush. I knew it wouldn't hold much longer under the relentless assault of this brutal adversary. With every impact from its unnerving strength and determination to kill us all, shards of wood flew from the battered entryway. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity of heart-pounding pressure and mounting fear, the door splintered apart. The creature's bulging muscles rippled as it charged into what remained of our feeble sanctuary. Instinctively reacting to the unparalleled threat before us, we opened fire with everything we had. Each shot pierced its thick hide, oozing rivulets of ebony ichor, but the onslaught seemed to only fuel its sadistic rage. Seeing that nothing in our arsenal could put this monster down, and realizing that we had arrived at a fatal impasse, we decided on an unspoken course of action. When the creature lunged once again, I grabbed the flare gun I'd conveniently discovered earlier and slammed it into the beast's snout. With one meaningful squeeze of the trigger, fire ignited within its monstrous nostrils. In that moment, we shattered a nearby window and leaped out, risking injury or worse against this undying foe. We found ourselves outside amidst the forest once more abandoning the creature within the burning cabin behind. The monstrous howls of anger and pain echoed hauntingly through the trees as we hurried back to the black deer to regroup. No one would believe our bloody ordeal without evidence. Placing trust in time-scarred tales of cryptids suddenly seemed easier now that our own harrowing experience was destined for future campfire stories. As days turned into weeks, we all harbored intense anxiety that the creature would return to exact its revenge. A monster like that couldn't be dispatched so easily. Its hatred for us must be as boundless as its fury was relentless. Then one day, lives resumed while seasoned battered wooden planks were nailed to seal a burned-out building's windows shut forever a futile gesture against a creature so powerful and cunning that even death wasn't strong enough to hold it back. And so left behind was a chilling reminder, an eerie whisper in forgotten woods. We undoubtedly bore witness to something far beyond comprehension and had no choice but to carry on with hope still flickering in our hearts, but not without an ever-present image at our mind's cruel edge of black eyes devoid of mercy, condemning us with the knowledge that nothing could ever make us safe from its monstrous reach. Our lives were altered irreversibly by a terror that shall remain forever lurking in the shadows of the Shenandoah National Forest.
Ever since I found that odd-looking coin on the ground near the mess hall, things have been feeling off. This happened on September 2, 2007, at Fort Forrest, Arizona, while my squad and I were preparing for deployment. The coin sparkled brilliantly under the sunlight and drew my attention instantly. It had a peculiar emblem engraved on it, as if it held some secret meaning. My name's Lincoln Abraham's son. I'm just your average Green Beret in the United States Army Special Forces. I never understood superstition or luck, but from the moment I picked up that cursed coin, my life started taking a darker turn. My squad consisted of Valentin Noguera, our demolition expert, and Avery Ledbetter, our medic. Sharing stories around our whiskey bottles was our favorite way to pass time during a quiet evening at Fort Forrest. On this night in particular, Valentine riled us up with a fitting tale about a creature from South American folklore known as El Infiernito, which roughly translates to Little Hell, as he described its bloodthirsty deeds and insatiable hunger for human flesh with surprising detail and enthusiasm, Avery suddenly cut him off mid-sentence with a well-timed burp. We all burst into laughter because it was just what we needed after such an eerie tale. The following morning brought an unusual fog to our base. Peculiar shapes loomed within the mist in the distance. At first glance, one could wave them off as twisted tree branches or remnants of last night's fire. However, as we geared up for routine training exercises with an uneasy atmosphere lingering in the air, we felt like someone or something was watching us. This wasn't your average creepy crawly feeling you'd get when staying up too late watching horror movies. These were moments we felt reality crumble beneath us. Our ammo supplies were first found sabotaged, with live rounds replaced with blanks. Then, Valentin lost his footing on a steep hill during an exercise and barely survived the tumble, claiming that someone had loosened the soil intentionally. Finally, our breaking point came when we discovered fresh animal carcasses one morning in front of our barracks. Their bodies were torn apart and blood splashed across the ground. Even Avery couldn't stomach the gory sight. I looked at my squad, noticing for the first time that their faces appeared pale with fear and uncertainty, and I knew that whoever or whatever was haunting us had crossed the line. Determined to uncover the identity of this unknown enemy, we came up with a plan. Utilizing my tracking skills, I managed to follow a set of peculiar tracks accompanied by Valentine and Avery. The tracks led us deeper into the surrounding forest, and we noticed that every now and then, they seemed to vanish completely, as if on purpose. The air became heavier with each step until we stumbled upon an old cabin hidden among dead trees and thick underbrush. That evening, we surrounded the cabin with stealthy vigilance, moving tactically as though this enemy were one of our own kind. Creeping forward in silence, Valentine took point while Avery covered our rear flank. As we neared the entrance to the decaying structure, our hearts raced in unison, a feeling shared by even good old skeptical Avery. Unsure what awaited us within its rotted walls, I entered first, while Valentine and Avery followed closely behind. To describe what we found inside would be putting it lightly. A grisly sight awaited us as gore-speckled walls stood in stark contrast against eerie candlelight casting shadows on mutilated human remains scattered throughout the room. My heart plunged at the sight. Is this what awaited us? As terror took hold of my core, I knew we couldn't leave this place uninvestigated. I glanced nervously at Valentine and Avery, their eyes amber in the dim light, reflecting fear and determination. I think we need to search the cabin for any clues. 
The sick freak who did this might still be around. Valentin muttered, his shaky breaths betraying his bravery. Nodding in agreement, we split up to examine every corner, leaving no drawer unopened or rug unturned. The rotting floorboards creaked under our boots, and a putrid stench permeated the air. As I made my way toward the back of the cabin, shivering at the viscera that stained the ratty curtains, I noticed an old brown diary on a dusty wooden table. Flipping through its hand-scrawled pages dated over a hundred years ago, I froze upon reading about a twisted character named Ellen Fiernito, the very creature from Valentine's folktale. Guys, check this out. I called my friends urgently. As they huddled around me and scanned the deteriorating pages, recognition dawned on their faces. It was impossible to deny that the events described in this diary eerily paralleled our recent misfortunes. My mind whirled as I tried to comprehend what grisly force tormented us from beyond the grave. We need to find that coin, Avery whispered through gritted teeth. By now, it was clear that this relic had triggered these supernatural occurrences. Returning it might be our only salvation. As we searched high and low in every crevice of that hellish cabin for any sign of the coin or its source, we failed miserably to find either. However, an engraved silver box beneath the floorboards caught my attention. Carving it loose with my knife revealed that it was adorned with identical symbols as those on the cursed coin. Avery, Valentine, I've got the box. I announced, my voice flickering between relief and uneasiness. Now what? Neither of us had an answer to that crucial question. We knew that without finding the elusive coin, placing it back in its rightful confinement might remain futile. Suddenly, Valentine cried out in pain from the back room. Avery and I rushed to his side, horrified to find him pinned against the wall by a grotesque, twisted force. The room seemed to have come alive. Some evil possessed it, and sought vengeance on our desperate attempts to stop it. Shoot it! Shoot it now! Valentine screamed as Avery unholstered his gun aiming directly at the monstrosity and snaring our friend. Three shots echoed through the cabin as blood splattered against the torn wallpaper. Did it work? I yelled over the ringing in my ears. Before we could catch our breaths, El Infiernito surged back with gaping bones as gnarled teeth bit into Valentine's arm. He screamed in agony while my firefighting instincts kicked into high gear. I snatched up a canister of gasoline we'd stashed near the entrance and doused the abomination without hesitation. Pulling out my lighter, I set its wretched form ablaze as Valentine stumbled free. We hobbled out of the inferno and watched with heavy hearts as our reality burned before our eyes. A guttural roar echoed through the night as El Infiernito vanished into flames howling like a devil facing its demise. Within moments, all that remained were the ashes of torment that danced on an angry wind. It's been a few days since that horrifying encounter, and we still haven't been able to locate the cursed coin or make sense of what transpired in those gruesome moments. But one thing is certain, El Infiernito may have returned to its underworld for now but we can't shake the feeling that it lingers on the fringes of our world, watching and waiting for another opportunity to seek vengeance. When you're embarking on a family camping trip, the one thing you all look forward to is quality time spent together almost oblivious to the fact that this trip will transform into a terrifying ordeal. We, a family of four, had planned the perfect getaway, 
an escape from our mundane lives within the confines of an RV parked amidst nature's sprawling beauty. The trip was not only meant for relaxation but also to celebrate my recent promotion at work. So, Robbie, what's the first thing you're going to do when we reach the camping site? My wife, Christine, asked as she prepared sandwiches for us in the RV's small kitchenette. Nursing a hot cup of coffee in hand and savoring its strong aroma, I replied with a smirk. Well, I'm going to find myself a comfortable hammock and retire in it till it's time for dinner. Is that okay, boss? She chuckled and replied with mock sternness. All right, but just this once. As we continued driving through the picturesque countryside roads of Kentucky, my kids, Dave and Carrie, were busy exploring every nook and cranny of the new terrain. Their excitement, mixed with my wife's laughter, made me feel truly alive. Once the sun dipped below the horizon and darkness embraced our surrounding silhouettes of trees, we finally reached our destination, a private campsite called Camp Denwood. Little did we know that this idyllic haven would soon turn into a dreadful nightmare that would shatter our sense of safety forever. In the pitch black night, as we settled in our cozy makeshift beds inside the RV and eagerly chatted about our plans for the next day while drifting off to sleep, suddenly there was an abrupt knock at one of the windows. My eyes flew open wide, as if somebody had slapped me awake. What was that? asked Christine concernedly. Maybe it's just a branch tapping against the glass. I reassured her my voice astoundingly calm while my heart pounded against its ribcage. Unsettled, we returned to bed, assuming our disturbed night's sleep would end convincingly. We couldn't be more wrong. As minutes turned into hours, the strange noises amplified, making us reconsider our decision to camp in an RV instead of a tent for added security. Peering out through a narrow gap in the window curtains, Christine spotted the silhouette of a man standing outside near the backwoods. The man was tall and appeared worn and messy, with his clothes ruffled and torn. It was evident he'd been living in harsh conditions. Our hearts raced as we shushed our frightened children, trying our best to stay quiet. Whoever he was, he knew we were inside. My mind swarmed with dreadful thoughts as every creak and rustle outside intensified. What did this enigmatic trespasser want with us? I scrambled for our emergency flashlight while recalling that the campsite owner had mentioned frequent reports of vandalism committed by a disturbed local. How could they not have warned us earlier about such morbid incidents? Whispering to Christine that I was going out to confront him, she grabbed my arm desperately and said, No! Stay here. Let's just call the police. The suffocating atmosphere inside our once safe haven saturated our lungs with fear as we dialed 911 with trembling fingers as every second seemed to stretch beyond comprehension. As we waited for help to arrive, Hardly daring even to breathe amidst an eerily silent night reflecting the turmoil churning within us, it became evident that escaping from this sinister scenario unscathed wasn't an option for us anymore. Suddenly a thunderous pounding on the door echoed throughout our RV that made our family shriek in terror. Someone screamed, Police! Open the door! As I hesitated, unsure if the terror of our situation had made me paranoid or if that knock actually warranted suspicion, Christine exchanged an indecisive glance with me. We formulated a silent plan. I would arm myself with a kitchen knife, just in case the person on the other side of the door had ill intentions, while Christine gingerly unlocked it. As we slowly opened the door, a burly police officer stood before us, looking concerned but stern. We received a 911 call. What's going on here? 
Christine launched into an explanation of the disturbing encounters that led us to our present circumstances. Without interrupting her, his eyes darted around the surrounding area, as if almost seeing something sinister lurking just out of sight. He asked for descriptions and identities involved in the incidents, and without hesitation, Christine provided them. An ominous silence fell over us as we hoped for some resolution or explanation from this officer of authority. He seemed deep in thought for a few long moments before speaking up. We've had issues with a man named Charlie McIntyre before. He's been known to terrorize newcomers to this rural area. We've been trying to put an end to his cruel games for years. With no further questions for us, he gave us his reassurance that they would increase patrols in the area and attempt to put an end to Charlie's menacing acts once and for all. In due time, we were escorted out of our RV by two additional officers who had arrived just moments earlier. Following their instructions to drive further into town and check into a hotel until they could guarantee our safety did little to quell our unease. Despite being more than just miles away from our terrifying ordeal in the RV by the third day after our escape, Christine and I couldn't shake our constant dread. As though taunting us, every knocking sound seemed like an omen of what was approaching. It was almost as if our subconscious would forever be haunted by what had taken place. A week passed with no word from the authorities, leaving Christine and me feeling deflated and vulnerable. So, when we finally heard from Officer Riley, the burly cop who initially arrived on the scene, we were eager for an update. I'm sorry to say that while we have tracked down where Charlie McIntyre apparently resides, it only increased the mystery surrounding his actions, sighed Officer Riley through the phone, frustration evident in his voice. Relaying the chilling fact that they found newspaper clippings about other families terrorized throughout the years plastered on the walls of his dwelling, he added with apprehension that they found no new leads on Charlie's whereabouts. Resigned to accepting that justice might not be served for us or any of Charlie's past victims, we returned to our lives scarred by fear and paranoia. Friends and family sometimes say, half-jokingly, that it's easy to forget the horror when you're back in civilization. But we know deep down that Charlie is out there, maybe eyeing his next victim or waiting to pounce when we least expect it. And whenever a knock on the door comes unexpectedly at night, I still find myself gripping a knife tightly, my heart pounding uncontrollably, while praying that this time it's not Charlie. When I think about the day my life and those of my closest friends changed forever, one phrase comes to mind, don't poke an angry dog, it'll bite you. I reckon we all realized the truth of this wisdom a little too late. It was just a random Thursday in October, and the air during our drive to Chesterfield Gorge Campground was as crisp as the conversation. I don't remember the exact date, but I do recall how the morning dew settled on our hiking boots as we laughed around the campfire. We were five guys who'd been pretty tight-knit since high school. This camping trip was our celebration of friendship. Mike, James, and Richard worked together at a tech startup, while Sam and I had been buddies since Little League Baseball. None of us knew or could have imagined what was coming for us that weekend. Before we embarked on our traditional evening hike from the campground to the nearby waterfalls, we noticed unusual splatters of red on some trees farther down the trail. At first, we didn't think much of them. Maybe blood from an unfortunate critter's mishap or an unexplainable natural phenomenon. But the more we talked about it and laughed it off nervously during sharp turns of banter between swapping old stories, 
a pit in my gut began to grow, making me uneasy. Our hike started as usual, exchanging funny jokes and laughing at Mike's terrible fire starters. We recognized that it felt more and more like those white-knuckle moments right before a storm hits, when everything is still but heavy with electricity. As we progressed deeper into the woods, we happened upon what looked like discarded clothing draped over tree branches, scattering in various directions from where they belong. The remnants seemed to mark a path leading somewhere further into the desolate forest. Inadvertently following these signs against our better judgment, our laughter started to fade as an eerie silence blanketed us. As we pressed on, we could feel a strange malevolence brewing, yet none of us could precisely pinpoint its source. It wasn't long before we glimpsed what appeared to be a man, or something not quite human, observing us from behind a sheer veil of low-hanging branches. We tried our best not to let the presence perturb us, but try as we might, our collective unease manifested in shortness of breath accompanied by furtive glances at one another. When Sam joked under his breath about this being straight out of a B-movie slasher flick, I could hear a touch of real terror breaking through his laughter. Let's head back, Richard muttered nervously. We collectively sighed seeing movement in the darkness. Something was stalking us from the shadows. However, an unknown force compelled James to carry on walking. No matter what Sam and I shouted or how desperately Mike tried to reel him back, he seemed dead set on plunging deeper into the forest with that stranger who kept darting between branches. As our distance from James and the fast approaching mysterious figure grew, it became challenging to make out any definitive features. The shape towered over James' hunched body, looking less human as it brandished wicked, bone-like protrusions that sliced shadowy streaks through the moonlit sky. The creature thing bellowed an otherworldly scream in response to Mike's suggestion that we veer in another direction. With none of us knowing quite who or what was stalking us on that ill-fated trip, we inadvertently stumbled into years' worth of pent-up frustration and violence aimed squarely at intruders like ourselves. Its gargantuan form charged toward Mike and Richard as they tried to help James find his way back to safety. Running for our lives in complete fear, each footfall thundering loud enough to shake the forest floor, I thought about Mike's tragic joke. Don't poke the angry dog. And that's when it struck. With a loud and sickening crunch, Sam disappeared headfirst into a thicket. His voice became a faint whisper as we ran, trying to outpace this ever-encroaching menace who'd butchered our friend without pause. Walls of darkness closed around us as we attempted to escape the wrath of whatever now basked in our bloodshed. We sprinted through the seemingly never-ending forest, each breath coming heavier than the last. The moon provided just enough light for us to avoid tripping on the roots and stones hidden beneath the fallen leaves. I don't know how long we ran, but somehow we managed to stumble upon an old, abandoned building. The paint was chipping off the walls, and vines snaked their way through broken windows. As we cautiously entered, the floorboards creaked beneath our feet. A sudden gust of wind forced the door to slam shut behind us, sending shivers up my arms. We knew we couldn't stay long, but exhaustion set in, leaving us with no choice but to rest for just a moment. We sat in silence until another member of our group, Emma, spoke up. I heard stories about this place. She whispered quietly so as not to alert our pursuer. The locals call it Redwood Manor. A moment later, she added, It's haunted by some kind of creature. Her voice trembled as she shared what she heard from a friend of a family member who lived nearby. This creature was known as the Redwood Butcher. 
In that instant, realization dawned on me. This creature must have been responsible for Sam's disappearance and all the bloodshed we had witnessed. It all lined up. The remote area we found ourselves in. The merciless nature of the attacks without any obvious motive. It was all too familiar to the urban legends surrounding the Redwood Butcher. Despite our fear and exhaustion, we made the decision to leave Redwood Manor almost as quickly as we had found it. We continued along a path that seemed barely used for years. Overgrown branches reached out like desperate arms, grabbing at us from all angles. Emerging from the deep woods into an open field, we spotted an old farmhouse in the distance. With no other options, we raced towards it, hoping to find a safe place to hide or maybe even someone who could help us. As I held the door to the farmhouse open for the others, my eyes scanned the property. It was eerily silent. I thought I saw movement in the distance, back towards where we had come from. It seemed like the redwood butcher had followed us. The smell of decay welcomed us as we entered the farmhouse. We ventured inside and found a landline phone on the wall, covered in dust. Desperation taking over, I tried dialing for help, but to our utter dismay, there was no connection. The line was dead. We decided to barricade ourselves in the small living room. From there, we could hear something creeping around outside, becoming more and more desperate as it tried to find a way in. Emma suddenly let out a scream just as a monstrous figure smashed through one of the living room windows. A tall and gaunt figure with mottled gray skin and wearing tattered clothing stood before us. The redwood butcher's eyes burned with murderous intent. Its blood-stained teeth were bared wide open in an animalistic howl. The creature lunged at us. My heart raced as pure survival instinct kicked in. We fought back with everything we had, attacking with furniture or whatever else we could get our hands on. Amidst the chaos, Jake managed to set fire to some old curtains and throw them onto the redwood butcher's grotesque form. Writhing in pain, partially engulfed in flames, the redwood butcher retreated from its attack and disappeared into the shadows of the night. Left behind was an overwhelming sense of dread that left us wondering if it would ever return. Injured but alive, we stayed awake through the rest of that harrowing night before making our way back home once daylight broke. For years, the town would whisper about that fateful night. Fearful of what lay in wait in the unexplored corners of the forest. And although we never spoke of it again, we all shared an unspoken agreement. We had come face to face with a monster straight from our darkest nightmares and lived to tell the tale. The sun began to set over the picturesque lake as my longtime friends Mike, Sarah, Lucy, and I were setting up camp near Mount Rainier in Washington. The sky was a beautiful palette of oranges, reds, and purples, painting a picture-perfect scene. As we pitched the tents, Mike proudly boasted that he had recently acquired his pilot's license. Hear that? Next time we'll fly to our camping spot, he joked. We all laughed, and I remember thinking how lucky I was to have such a close group of friends with whom I could enjoy these brief escapes from the mundane. Little did we realize that our idyllic retreat would soon turn into an unimaginable nightmare. Later that evening, after dinner around the campfire and reminiscing about old times, we decided to turn in early for a full day of hiking the next day. We crawled into our tents, and it was not long before the sounds of my friends snoring filled the silence. But sleep escaped me as my mind wandered through memories of past camping trips. 
A rustling in the bushes behind our campsite jolted me back to reality. Coyotes had been known to roam around this area, so I grabbed a flashlight and stepped outside to investigate. What confronted me when I turned on my flashlight was anything but normal. It appeared to be a man but was covered head to toe in dirt and mud, wearing what seemed like tattered clothing. My heart threatened to stop as this grotesque figure lumbered toward me. Instinct took over, and I sprinted back towards Mike's tent, yelling at him to wake up. We needed help now. Our emotions tapped into their primal fear as the discordant wailing continued throughout the night from different locations around our campsite. The apparition would appear and then vanish without warning. We all stood guard by the fire but no one dared venture beyond its flickering perimeter. As dawn crept over the horizon, the wailing noises eventually subsided, but those agonizing hours had been etched upon our weary faces. With trembling hands and shallow breaths, we quickly packed up our camp and fled for the relative safety of civilization. In that moment of horror, we had discovered profound depths of physical and emotional strength where only terror was written. It was as if this specter had emerged from our darkest nightmares to remind us that the veneer of security fostered in our day-to-day -day world was an illusion. Our once close-knit group disbanded after that fateful night, each grappling with an unspoken burden. Even now, years later, I find my thoughts uncontrollably drawn to that terrifying encounter. Sleep offers no refuge, as my dreams are haunted by that ghastly figure and its cacophonous cries. I run in fear through dense forests while those howls of agony echo through my psyche like wolves hungry for the hunt. As much as we attempt to understand or categorize events like these through fact and logic, some horrors defy explanation as they continually slip between the slender spaces of known comprehension. Though many elements will remain a mystery, perhaps it is an unknown fear that binds tightly to our consciousness that holds the most chilling secrets. Eventually, strained relationships began to mend, and speeches softened with a certain subtle understanding born from surviving a shared trauma. Each of us journeyed far into the protective comforts of secure homes and successful lives, far from wild forests where creatures lie hidden in whispers beyond reason. And recently, during a chance reunion with Sarah at a trendy cafe in Seattle several years after it all happened, she shared in hushed tones stories she had researched recounting similar encounters throughout Washington's wooded territories stretching back decades. Her eyes shone brightly with fearful fascination as she whispered, I saw something else that night, too frightened to tell you all. But even as Sarah began revealing her terrifying secret, the last rays of daylight dissolved, drowning the city's busy streets in impenetrable darkness. As the darkness enveloped us, I could see that Sarah was shaking, clearly horrified by her recollection of that night. The rest of our group leaned in closer, eager to hear the terrifying secret she had been keeping. Breathing heavily, Sarah continued, I saw a creature. It had dark, matted fur, piercing red eyes, and stood on two legs like a man, but it was no man. We exchanged worried looks as we listened to her chilling description of this unknown being. The name Red-Eyed Ripper echoed in our minds as we recalled multiple similar encounters reported throughout Washington's wooded territories over the years. Rumors often circulated about this mysterious creature who haunted those who strayed too deep into the woods. The next day, determined to verify Sarah's harrowing tale, we searched online for local legends and recent sightings. One name consistently appeared to be associated with the creature, Richard Cade, an infamous serial killer known for dismembering his victims and leaving parts scattered around his hunting grounds. 
we discovered testimonies shared by investigators that Cade had supposedly mastered some form of ancient shamanic ritual that granted him supernatural abilities. These powers allowed him to transform into an ominous beast with a thirst for human blood. He targeted innocent hikers and campers who unknowingly trespassed on his territory. Knowing the unnerving truth about the creature lurking within Washington's dense forest, we swore to never let our guard down again. We stocked up on supplies and weapons to defend ourselves against any potential encounter with the dreaded Red-Eyed Ripper. A few days later, as my friend and I were hiking through the very same wooded area where Sarah's encounter occurred, we both felt a sense of foreboding. Suddenly, breaking an uneasy silence, a voice called out in the distance. Hey! You guys should be careful around here! There have been some strange things happening lately. The voice came from an elderly man with a grizzled appearance. He wore a small backpack and carried a walking stick, both worn from years of use. It's not safe for people like you out here. He warned ominously, making direct eye contact. You never know what you might run into. We exchanged nervous glances as we thanked the old man for his advice and continued on our hike. Though we could not be sure, we felt an unshakable suspicion that this man knew more than he was letting on. As evening approached and day turned into night, we realized that we were lost. We hurriedly set up camp, shivering in fear at all the unnerving sounds crowding the darkness around us. Suddenly, we heard a blood-curdling scream nearby. Grabbing our weapons, we cautiously ventured toward the source of the noise and found a fellow hiker gruesomely dismembered, her body parts strewn about like some twisted crime scene. Retching in horror at the grisly sight, we knew there was no turning back. The red-eyed ripper was upon us, lurking in wait for his next victim. We raced back to our campsite and stayed awake through the night, alert to every shuffle and snap of a twig. As morning light broke through the trees, relief washed over us. We had survived an encounter with a terrible murderer who haunted these woods with lethal efficiency, for now at least. With heavy hearts burdened by what we had witnessed and learned about Richard Cade, the Red-Eyed Ripper, our group disbanded. We dispersed across the country in efforts to move on from our traumatic experiences with sinister forces preying on unsuspecting people whose only crimes were their innocence and their love for nature's beauty. But no matter how far away each of us traveled, it seemed impossible to forget the chilling presence of the beast among those dark, whispering trees. Deep down, we all knew that a part of the red-eyed ripper would linger in our nightmares forever, a constant reminder that primal evil walked the earth in search of its next prey. And what became of Richard Cade, the red-eyed ripper? For us, his presence would forever cast a dark shadow over Washington's wooded territories. Perhaps it was only a matter of time before we would have to face him once more if we dared return to those haunted woods. It was sweltering hot that summer, and as I wiped the sweat off my brow, I casually mentioned to my colleagues that I once tried to make a career out of competitive thumb wrestling. They all burst into laughter and said it would take a unique talent to actually excel in that field. Little did I know that our usual banter would be overshadowed by a series of horrific events in our town of Maple Creek, Massachusetts. That afternoon, rumors quickly circulated about an explicit, gruesome image discovered at the local dog park. Without going into too much detail, it was a disturbing scene the likes of which our small town had never witnessed before. 
fear gripped everyone as the seemingly random act of violence had us all questioning our once safe community. A few days later, walking home from work after pulling a double shift at the hospital where I worked as a nurse gave me an eerie feeling. The convenience store clerk and I exchanged nervous glances as I paid for toilet paper and some fruit from our candy jar, an inside joke among us since healthier options were scarce in the store. On my way out, I bumped into the local sheriff, who was going over sketches with one of his deputies. He shook his head in disbelief when he saw me. You look like you've seen better days, he said. Long day at work, I replied with a half smile. As night fell, my signature neon pink umbrella seemed unusually dim among the shadows outside my apartment building. The streets were deserted. Folks held on to each other behind locked doors, hoping we'd be spared from the carnage that seemed to loom closer every day. Pouring myself a glass of cheap vodka just to unwind after another heavy day at work didn't seem like an unreasonable idea. Taking that first sip yielded that predictable burn as the liquid slid down. It was almost comforting, something steady and unwavering in this time of uncertainty. Just as I settled back down on the tattered couch in my small studio apartment, a knock on the door startled me. Peering through the peephole, I recognized my childhood friend and fellow nurse, Amanda. Her face revealed that she brought with her news that couldn't wait. The police found another crime scene. She briskly informed me as soon as I opened the door. Sickening stuff, just like before. But this time, they found a message. A chill ran up my spine as she relayed what little information she had gleaned from her sources within law enforcement. The message contained a sinister riddle of sorts, taunting the town's residents and promising more acts of terror. We shuddered at the demented mind behind such gruesome displays. In the following chaotic days, our once quaint and peaceful town turned into a living nightmare. Maple Creek was now haunted by an unseen predator lurking among us. Conversations among neighbors became hushed whispers, and every encounter raised suspicion. We worked tirelessly at the hospital, treating an influx of patients suffering anxiety attacks and stress-related illnesses as a result of the unfolding events. Our daily routines became oppressive with fear and dread hanging heavy in the air. As I walked home one evening, my neon pink umbrella now replaced with a more covert black number, I couldn't shake the sensation that I was being watched. Quickening my pace did little to dissolve that unnerving feeling gnawing at me. I turned a corner and spotted a dark figure standing by an old oak tree. It appeared to be staring directly at me, eyes empty yet filled with malice. Panic shot through me as though someone had dipped their fingers in ice water and gracefully traced it down my spine. I wanted to scream or run, but instead, I tried reasoning with myself. It's just some weirdo playing a trick. You've just got yourself worked up. But as we locked eyes and the figure smirked, I could sense that the terror was far from over. In a sudden, fluid motion, the figure produced a glistening blade and started walking towards me. No, not walking. Gliding. My heart raced wildly in my chest. All rational thoughts slipped away, and my mind was now consumed with one singular goal, to escape. I forced my legs to move and sprinted in the opposite direction the menacing figure giving chase with each agonizing stride. Time seemed distorted, blurring reality and perception, as I scrambled toward what I prayed would be salvation. As I sprinted down the dark alley, my shoes slipped on the wet cobblestones, and I lost my footing. I fell hard onto the cold ground, pain radiating through my side. The menacing figure was now only mere feet away. 
A passerby must have spotted us and called for help because blue and red lights began to flood the narrow street as sirens blared closer. The mysterious figure halted in his tracks, casting a spiteful glare my way. Confusion washed over me as I recognized Tom Harris, a seemingly ordinary man who ran a small convenience store on Main Street. He was middle-aged, with receding gray hair and a stout build. The glinting knife in his hand and the twisted smile on his face now painted him as anything but ordinary. You've got nowhere to run, Tom. I shouted desperately into the downpour. Tom hesitated for a moment before sprinting in the opposite direction. The police arrived just seconds later and quickly took pursuit of Tom as I relayed what little I knew of what was happening. They navigated the congested streets while the rain relentlessly poured down, drenching everyone involved. The chase spanned several blocks until, finally, officers cornered him in a narrow dead-end alleyway. As they dragged him out, kicking and screaming, I dared to approach the man once known as Tom Harris, just an ordinary shopkeeper turned murderer. Why? was all I could muster. His wild eyes met mine as he barked out laughter, cold and sinister, before responding. You'll know soon enough. Despite his apprehension by the police, Maple Creek remained tense and uncertain. The horrific acts committed by Tom Harris have left an indelible mark on our community. Tensions remained high as people continued to lock their doors tightly at night. It was four days after Tom's arrest when I received an anonymous letter at my apartment. Hands shaking, I opened the envelope, revealing a hastily scrawled message. Tom Harris isn't the only one. This is far from over. Attached to the note was a torn photo of Tom with several other individuals. They seemed to be exchanging suspicious glances. The image was taken months ago in a place I vaguely recognized, but I couldn't quite put my finger on exactly where. A chilling feeling crawled over me as I scanned their faces. Some were familiar, but others remained strangers. Was this truly just the beginning? How much more would we endure at the hands of these depraved individuals? In my meeting with Sheriff Daniels, I shared the letter and photo in hopes that these clues could lead to further understanding and answers. He promised a thorough investigation and increased police presence in our once quiet town. As day turned into night, I sat by my window, watching the rain slowly drizzle down on Maple Creek. I clutched my phone tightly in my hand, considering if life would ever return to normal and if we would ever feel safe again. Suddenly, a shadow appeared at the edge of my vision standing near the old oak tree where it all started. A figure eerily similar to Tom glared in my direction before slowly slipping away into obscurity. My heart raced as I considered the words written in that terrifying letter. This is far from over. It all began on June 2nd. I had been going through a rough patch in my life following a string of failed relationships and decided to give online dating a try. Why not? I thought to myself. As the eldest sibling in my family, I always had a knack for making people laugh with my self-deprecating humor and genuine interest in their lives. I swiped right and left on the dating app choosing individuals who seemed appealing based on their appearances since I had very little to go off of from their short profiles. After a series of shallow conversations, I met someone who seemed genuinely intriguing. Our online chats flowed easily, filled with witty banter and shared interests. It was refreshing to find such a connection among countless dull matches. 
At last, we decided to meet in person at an eclectic speakeasy located in an old industrial part of Portland. That night, the unsettling unease started when I found a blood-stained napkin lying conspicuously on the street outside my apartment building. Being accustomed to occasional oddities in the city, however, I pushed away any uneasiness and continued on my date. Entering the dimly lit speakeasy, the atmosphere was like stepping back in time. Soft jazz played in the background as patrons whispered animatedly amongst themselves. My date appeared charismatic and seemed even more captivating than over text. As our conversation progressed smoothly over well-crafted cocktails, a news alert flashed across my phone's screen. A body had been found mutilated nearby. We exchanged unsettled glances but chose not to let it disrupt our evening together. We eventually left the speakeasy and walked around a bit more to explore this unfamiliar part of the city together before we called it a night. During our stroll, we were met with peculiar glances from passers-by, as if sensing something off about my date. At one point, while browsing through records at an old vinyl shop, my date pulled out a record sleeve that looked oddly familiar, like something out of my childhood. It sent a chill down my arm as I quickly dismissed the coincidence. Unsettled by the entire night's events and feeling slightly tipsy, I nervously cracked a joke about how meeting people online almost makes you feel like you're playing Russian roulette with your life. My date responded with an eerie smile saying that life is full of risks anyway. I couldn't tell if that was supposed to be comforting or threatening. While walking back to our respective homes, a loud thud behind us startled both of us, as if someone had thrown a heavy bag against a brick wall. As we investigated further, it became clear that the source was entirely human. A macabre sight lay in front of us, a person crumpled on the pavement, their body twisted into unnatural angles, and their clothes stained with blood. My stomach clenched as wave after wave of disgust washed over me. My date's reaction was horrifying. Instead of fear or shock, they seemed unfazed by the gruesome scene in front of us. Their expression remained eerily calm as they wiped a trace of blood from their hand onto their pants leg. I tried to convince myself that this was all just one giant coincidence. Perhaps they'd simply been at the wrong place at the wrong time. But as we part ways and I watch their back disappear into the darkness, I can't shake the gut-wrenching feeling that screams there's something sinister about this person who has come into my life. As I rushed home, my heart racing in my chest, I heard sirens blaring in the distance accompanied by sounds of chaos echoing through the city streets. Unsure now if those cries were born from panic or something far more horrific, all I could do was hope to make it back safely before my night took an even darker turn. Hoping to make it home safely, I quickened my pace, feeling that sinister presence grow farther away with each step. The thoughts of my date and the gruesome scene we witnessed kept replaying in my mind. The following day, sheer curiosity led me to look up news about any incidents that had occurred the previous night. The headline that caught my attention read, Brutal Murder Shake City, Local Man Found Dead. The details of the article matched the macabre scene I had encountered with my date. As I was reading the comments section, someone claimed to know information about a suspect named Victor Grayson. Victor Grayson, that name rang a bell. My date mentioned knowing Victor, talking about him as a longtime friend. Something deep down urged me to dig deeper into Victor Grayson's past. Despite not wanting to become involved in a murder case, I couldn't shake this nagging feeling. I reached out to a friend who had some connections at the local police department and asked him if he could find out anything about Victor Grayson. 
He agreed but told me not to expect much, given the confidentiality of ongoing investigations. Two days later, my friend called me back with shocking information. Victor Grayson was a person of great interest in several murder cases over the past few years, all with strikingly similar characteristics involving brutality and precision of execution. I gasped as realization set in. Could my date be involved in these murders? Was their connection to Victor more than just friendship? Suddenly, I got another call from an unknown number. With trembling hands I answered, and an eerily familiar voice greeted me. It was my date calling from that night. They asked nonchalantly why we hadn't spoken since our rendezvous and proposed another meeting, tonight. Fear gripped me as indecision plagued my mind. But one thing was clear, this person was dangerous, and I needed to handle this situation carefully. My voice shaking, I agreed to the meeting at a nearby park, hoping that being in a public place would provide some safety. As night approached, I considered calling the police but decided against it. After all, my friend had shared confidential information with me, information that could jeopardize both our careers if revealed. I made my way to the park with a heavy heart and a racing mind evaluating every possible outcome. There, I found my date waiting on a bench by the fountain, their expression still eerily calm and collected. Nervously, I struck up a conversation, steering towards recent events in the city. When I mentioned Victor Grayson's name along with details of the murders only an insider would know, my date's face turned cold. Just as they tried to speak their defense, a loud scream echoed through the park. In the darkness of a nearby alleyway, I glimpsed Victor Grayson himself assaulting yet another victim. In that moment of chaos and fear, I sprinted toward the alleyway to help, screaming for others nearby to call the police. As Victor fled into the shadows and officers arrived on sight, I saw my date slip away too leaving me alone in a whirlwind of terror and confusion. In the days following Victor Grayson's escape, it became apparent that he wasn't acting alone. My date was now also under investigation as his accomplice. Despite assisting authorities in providing whatever details I could about that fateful night and my experience with my eerie date, they both remained elusive. The findings led me to question everything, human nature, friendships, and new relationships. To this day, the memory of those gruesome events leaves me wondering what is lurking just beyond our understanding of human behavior, and how close we can get to danger without ever realizing it. Meanwhile, Victor Grayson and his unsettling partner remain at large, leaving behind nothing but a trail of terror and unanswered questions. As I sipped my lukewarm coffee, I glanced at the calendar on my kitchen wall. October 4th was a dull Thursday morning that held no special significance for me. Little did I know that this seemingly ordinary day would ignite one of the most disturbing experiences of my life. At the time, I was stationed at Fort Bragg in North Carolina, working on a top-secret military operation. The exact details are classified, but our mission involved surveying a remote area known only as Sector 7. There was an air of mystery surrounding this specific location and it made everyone in our unit uneasy. Our squad received last-minute orders to assemble and head out to Sector 7. We boarded our armored Humvees and set off into the unknown, though we could never have anticipated what awaited us. Upon arriving at the deserted location, we were immediately struck by an unnerving silence that filled the air. Progressing deeper into the sector, 
we happened upon something genuinely horrific that turned our stomachs. Six mutilated bodies lying in a perfect circle. Each victim's body was grotesquely contorted, with their eyes carved out and mouth set in a rictus grin. Shaken by the gruesome spectacle, we carefully began investigating the scene. Just then, our team's medic discovered ominous symbols etched into each victim's skin. Though unfamiliar with these markings, I couldn't shake the feeling that they were steeped in folklore and closely connected to some venerated creature. As dusk began to set in across Sector 7's desolate landscape and tension continued rising among our squad members, we heard echoes through the surrounding wilderness that sent chills down our spines, animalistic guttural cries echoing from an unseen source. Taking defensive positions around the perimeter, rifles leveled at the darkness encroaching upon us, we all sensed some imminent threat lurking nearby. Adjusting my focus to peer closer into the darkness, my eyes caught sight of a figure that appeared human but seemed different. The shadowy figure possessed elongated limbs, with blood oozing from an inky black mass where their face should have been an appalling sight I now wish I could forget. Letting out an eerie scream in response to our presence, the entity suddenly lunged towards us. Our team opened fire as we scrambled to formulate a plan of defense. Despite our meticulous military training, nothing could have prepared us for this harrowing encounter. My heart raced, adrenaline surging through my body as I fired shot after shot at this seemingly unstoppable creature. Amidst this rapid exchange of gunfire and chaos, I noticed one of our squad members mangled beyond recognition, his body torn into lifeless pieces and strewn across the ground like ragdoll shreds. We continued to fight desperately against the supernatural force assaulting us from the darkness drowning out the sounds of terror that echoed off the desolate landscape. That's when my radio crackled to life with static-encased words from command. Stand down! Regroup at base camp. Leave no traces. And so, we retreated under the darkness's cover, carrying heavy hearts and haunted eyes back with us. The incident that occurred during those horrifying hours remains unresolved to this day, with all records buried deep within classified archives. But for me, October 4th will forever etch its hideous scars onto my memory, serving as a chilling reminder that some horrors lie in wait on the fringes of existence. And as for Sector 7? Its haunted grounds remain forever shrouded in enigma a macabre testament to humanity's constant dance with terror. As we arrived at the base camp, the mood among the team members was somber, their faces a mix of shock and disbelief. We were debriefed by our commanding officer, who informed us that the entity haunting Sector 7 was none other than the infamous Kelpie, a shape-shifting creature of Scottish folklore. I had heard stories about the Kelpie during my childhood, but I always dismissed them as mere fairy tales. The notion that something like that actually existed was terrifying. The CO explained that he received this information from a local historian who claimed to have discovered an ancient text documenting the Kelpie's existence in our region. The text detailed its supernatural abilities and deadly reputation while warning of the dire consequences for those who dared to venture into its domain. Knowing what we were up against only intensified our dread, but there was no turning back now. With no other information to go on, we resigned ourselves to this horror and tried as best as we could to prepare for the inevitable confrontation. Two days later, Without warning or mercy, the Kelpie struck again. This time it attacked a group of children playing near a riverbank not far from base camp. We raced over as fast as we could, praying that we might be able to save them, but we were too late. 
The scene before us was gruesome. Three of the children lay where they had been brutally mutilated by an unknown force. The fourth child was missing entirely. We set out once again into Sector 7 with grim determination, acknowledging that our priority was simply to contain this nightmare and protect any remaining survivors. I glanced at my watch. It was 2.03 p.m. We continued our search for hours, slogging through murky waters and trudging through abandoned buildings in an attempt to predict where it would strike next. Instead of falling into despair or allowing fear to paralyze us, we focused on our training, using the information we had been given to anticipate its movements. Shortly after 7.48 p.m., our efforts were rewarded when we encountered the Kelpie in a desolate area of Sector 7. Its ghastly form was an unspeakable mixture of human and equine features, with dripping wet, matted hair and eyes that glowed red with malevolence. It towered over us, teeth bared, as it prepared to attack. We unleashed a barrage of gunfire and explosives, trying to bring down the horror before us. The monstrous figure shrieked and flailed violently but didn't waver. As the battle progressed, it became increasingly apparent that our attacks were having little impact on the beast. Suddenly, just as quickly as it had appeared, the Kelpie vanished from view, leaving a trail of blood and devastation in its wake. We knew that subduing it would be a monumental task but abandoning Sector 7 was simply not an option. We regrouped and pressed forward, refusing to forfeit our mission. In the days that followed, we encountered the Kelpie multiple times, each confrontation as violent and disturbing as the last. The creature remained elusive but still wrought carnage throughout Sector 7. Despite our best attempts at containment, Surviving residents reported sightings and heard its chilling cries echo through the night. Eventually, with heavy hearts and no clear resolution in sight, Sector 7 was declared lost, and its remaining populace was evacuated promptly. The once bustling area now lay barren and abandoned, a mere shell of its former self. As our unit was disbanded and relocated to different assignments, we all carried with us haunting memories of those gut-wrenching days spent combating an impossibly immortal antagonist. And while the events of October 4th may have been relegated to classified archives by the higher-ups, those of us who survived never forgot Sector 7 and the grim specter it had left behind. The Kelpie remains a mystery to this day, its wrath enshrouded in the shadows of that forsaken place. Authorities continue to listen for whispers of its torment, standing vigilant should the creature ever return. An eerie reminder that some legends are more than just stories and that the darkest secrets lie hidden in the fringes of our world. My day had been an uneventful one just like every other Friday. I was stocking the shelves at the convenience store where I worked when a buddy, Billy, stopped by on his lunch break. We exchanged a few jokes and witty remarks about our childhood, specifically the time we found a stash of cigars in my uncle's shed and smoked them until we both puked. We laughed at the memory before he left to go back to his own job. It wasn't until around 10 p.m., when I went to take out the trash, that the night took an unexpected and grisly turn. I slid open the back door of the store, only to find Aaron, a co-worker who had left earlier, lying on the ground in a pool of blood. His body looked torn and shredded, as if some wild animal had attacked him with vicious force. What the fuck? The words barely escaped my lips as I tried not to retch at the sight. I quickly called for an ambulance, explaining what I had found while trying not to let panic conquer me. 
As I stared down at Aaron's body, seeing his eyes fixed open in terror, fear crept its way up my spine. That's when I noticed that something else was off, something that made this scene even more horrifying. Apart from Aaron's ripped clothes and shredded skin, there were symbols carved into his chest, intricate circles interconnected with twisting lines. I recognized those very same symbols as some old Native American markings from researching my heritage as a member of the Navajo Nation. My ancestors would never dare cause harm like this, though. It was against our beliefs. The paramedics arrived minutes later and pronounced Aaron dead on arrival. His wounds were too severe. The police also showed up to investigate and questioned everyone who had been in contact with Aaron earlier that night. While they were examining Aaron's body and looking for evidence around it, one officer found a gnarled piece of wood next to him. I instantly recognized it as a fetish stick, an old ceremonial object used by my people for various rituals. It seemed out of place, but its presence there put me on edge. This was no ordinary murder. I don't understand, I said to Billy when he walked over, also witnessing the horrific scene. What could do such a thing? Billy glanced around nervously, his voice barely audible as he whispered. It almost looks like something out of those old Native American stories we'd hear when we were kids. I remembered the stories too, ones passed down through generations in my family about horrifying creatures with an insatiable lust for human blood and destruction. Each creature had its own set of legends and secrets but one had always struck me as particularly gruesome. I never dreamed it could be real, though. As I stood there feeling vulnerable and shaken, suddenly Billy caught sight of something moving beyond the dumpster. What is that? He asked incredulously. Both our eyes locked onto the figure emerging from behind the dumpster, its grotesque physique coming into full view in the dim light outside the back door. It was indeed something straight out of nightmares, a creature whose head looked like the skull of an elk with sharp, branching antlers on each side, its body distorted in a mix of human and animal features. The creature snarled at us with rage burning in its eyes before dashing away into the darkness at breakneck speed. As our hearts pounded with adrenaline and our minds reeled from what we had just witnessed, one thing became implicitly clear to both of us. Everything we experienced that night was not just some urban legend. This encounter had been all too real and terrifyingly plausible. And who knows what will happen next? Billy and I knew we had to get out of there and find help. The next day, we went into town and asked around if anyone knew anything about this creature that resembled the horrifying stories from our childhood. People looked at us like we were crazy, but one old man took us aside and started telling us about a legend among our tribe, the legend of the Wendigo. He explained that the creature we saw was a Wendigo, a malevolent spirit that was once human but had become corrupted by greed and the taste for human flesh. It was said that those who engaged in cannibalism during times of famine would become cursed and transform into these vile monsters. The appearance of a Wendigo in our community meant that someone or something had unleashed this dark force upon our people. We spent days researching old texts and asking questions in our community, determined to find a way to stop the Wendigo without directly confronting it, knowing fully well that we were no match for its strength. Eventually, we found out that an exiled shaman from our tribe had been in the area recently, brandishing the same fetish stick found near Aaron's body. The shaman had dealings with dark forces and was cast out for attempting to summon a Wendigo years ago as an act of revenge on the tribe. We believed he might have finally succeeded in his sinister goal. Fearing for the safety of our loved ones, 
We contacted local authorities and shared all our findings with them. Of course, hearing stories of an ancient monster roaming around didn't sit well with them, but the evidence surrounding Aaron's death and sightings of this mysterious shaman convinced them something was definitely off. What ensued was a manhunt on an unprecedented scale as police and tribal officials worked together to locate this dangerous individual. During their search efforts, several more gruesome attacks took place across town, which eyewitnesses claimed to be the work of a monster. The community was sent into a state of terror, understanding that no one was safe from this Wendigo or its dark summoner. Finally, after some time of searching and more lives lost, the authorities arrested the disgraced shaman deep within the woods. He was found to be in possession of fetish sticks and other ritual items, undeniable proof of his role in unleashing the Wendigo on the community. With him captured, we hoped that the nightmare would finally come to an end. As days went by without any sign of further attacks, people started to breathe a sigh of relief again. However, our tribe knew that it wasn't entirely over. With the Wendigo still out there in the wilderness, we could never completely put our hearts at rest. We held a ceremony, trying to appease the spirits, hoping this tragedy would spare our community from further misfortune. Nowadays, I occasionally look out into the forest surrounding our small town and wonder if it's still out there, hungry for its next meal. Knowing somewhere deep down that this malevolent creature was ultimately born from human greed makes me reflect on how important it is for us not to fall prey to our darker instincts. As I sit here now, recounting my memories and immortalizing our harrowing experience with words, I can only pray that sharing our story will remind us all to keep an eye on the shadows and never forget that some things are better left undisturbed. As a self-proclaimed skeptic, I never put much stock in my Native American heritage's old stories and superstitions. Still, there I stood, outside the brick building I'd always considered my sanctuary, the Happy Pines Library on the border of Montana and Idaho. Despite my interest in paranormal literature, I have always remained comfortably aloof from those urban legends and tall tales. On that crisp autumn afternoon in late October, everything changed. The years have not been easy on Happy Pines. Relationships have ended, marriages have dissolved, and even lifelong friendships have been tested. I don't get it, my best friend Riley said as we walked out of the library. We had just checked out a hefty stack of true crime novels about bizarre mysteries that were waiting to be solved by some amateur sleuth or obsessed detective. Why would you even bother reading this stuff when you don't believe in any of it? It's like comfort food. I replied with a lopsided smile. You know it's probably terrible for you, but it's so satisfying. Riley laughed and nudged me with her elbow. You're so weird. Pot calling the kettle black. I teased as we continued toward my house. We were halfway down Old Pine Trail when we stumbled across an unsettling sight, an apparent crime scene saturated with dark crimson streaks extending across approximately 30 feet of pavement. A stifling sense of unease hung heavy in the air as I exchanged worried glances with Riley. What the heck happened here? She asked, her eyes wide with shock. I looked around nervously, unable to shake the eerie feeling that something was watching us from just beyond our line of sight. I don't know, but this isn't right. My hands were clammy despite the cool air creeping closer toward an evening chill. Without warning, an unearthly howl pierced through the silence echoing through the trees and curdling our blood. The sound was unlike anything either of us had ever heard, 
as though hundreds of voices were shrieking in terror and agony. What was that? Riley barely managed, her voice a trembling whisper. I don't know. My stomach clenched as another wave of panic coursed through me. Every instinct screamed for us to run, but my legs seemed rooted in place, paralyzed with fear. My breath caught in my throat when I noticed something lurking in the shadows, a hulking figure with twisted limbs and a distorted face that made my skin crawl. Its grotesque form seemed to embody the eerie folklore of my Native American ancestors. My rational mind refused to consider the possibility that this creature could be real. Inadvertently, I took a step backward, only to feel Riley's hand grip my arm tightly, her knuckles white. We need to go, she hissed under her breath. I nodded in silent agreement, slowly forcing one foot in front of the other until we'd put enough distance between ourselves and that nightmare-inducing thing lurking beside Old Pine Trail. We didn't stop running until we burst into my house, slamming the door behind us and leaning heavily against it, exhausted yet miles from feeling safe. As evening turned to night, our hysteria gave way to confusion and disbelief. Was it possible that we'd stumbled upon some ancient evil rooted in Native American folklore? Or had our shared obsession with strange mysteries warped our minds? Just as we thought that maybe, just maybe, all was safe and nothing had followed us home. A slow creaking noise echoed from the hallway outside my room, dread pooling within my chest again. We exchanged panicked glances, too afraid to breathe. I crept towards the hallway, my heart pounding in my chest. It was then that the front door swung open, revealing my neighbor, Mrs. Hansen, her face a mixture of concern and curiosity. Are your kids okay? I heard all the commotion earlier, she said hesitantly. Relief washed over me as I realized it was just her causing the creaking noises. Yeah, Mrs. Hansen, we're fine. I stuttered, still shaken by our encounter on Old Pine Trail. Riley glanced at me and decided not to reveal what had happened. Over the next few days, we tried to go about our normal routines. However, the memory of that monstrous creature was always lurking in the back of our minds. It wasn't until we visited the local library that things took a chilling turn. While researching Native American legends and folklore in an attempt to identify the creature we'd encountered, we stumbled upon an old newspaper article from decades ago. It detailed a series of mysterious incidents and disappearances from around Old Pine Trail, all tied to sightings of a twisted, deformed figure haunting the area. Riley pointed at a particular detail mentioned in the article, its name, Hasty and Shield the Guy, which roughly translated means, Man with Distorted Limbs. We stared at each other, realizing that was precisely what we'd seen that night. As we pieced together more information about Hasty and Shield the Guy from old records, legends, and whispers from locals who had lived through those terrible times decades ago, we began to feel even more unnerved. The creature seemed to be some sort of vengeful spirit linked to Native American tribes that had suffered deeply due to encroachment and mistreatment by settlers. Now it seemed as if their pain had manifested into this horrifying apparition that threatened the lives of others, perhaps as a form of retribution. But how could we possibly stop something like that? The thought frightened us to our core. In a desperate attempt to rid ourselves of this nightmare, Riley and I decided to perform a cleansing ritual that we'd found in an old Native American shamanic book. With trepidation, we gathered the prescribed herbs and performed the ceremony that was said to appease and banish malevolent spirits like Hasty and Shield the Guy. That night, the air felt slightly less thick with tension and dread. 
Had we successfully appeased the creature, or would it continue its horrific reign over our town? Weeks turned into months, and without any sightings or incidents involving Hasty and Chiel Dugai, life in our community regained normalcy. Riley and I often discussed whether or not what we did had any real impact on the creature or if it had merely been hiding, waiting for its chance to strike again. One day, while walking home from school, I felt an uneasiness wash over me, accompanied by a strong sense of being watched. I turned my head to see old pine trail behind me as a chilling gust of wind sent shivers down my spine. Though the terror of our encounter with Hasty and Shield the guy subsided over time, the fear of that twisted figure emerging from the shadows never quite left us. As the years went by and we grew older, Riley and I eventually moved away from our hometown, but no matter how far we ventured or what new adventures awaited us, the lingering terror of the mysterious creature would remain tucked away in our minds an eerie reminder of an unending nightmare. There I was, just polishing off the last crumbs of my sandwich, when my co-worker, Steve, started talking about a place in the Arkansas woods he called The Hollow. It seemed like just another random lunchtime conversation topic, but little did I know how pivotal that story would be. You see, I'm a pipeline worker, and at the time, we were assigned to a remote construction site in the state. It just so happened that our ongoing project bordered this wooded area that Steve was speaking of. As I listened to him recount stories he'd heard from some of the older workers about people who had been attacked by some mysterious creature out there, I couldn't help but roll my eyes and call it hogwash. Steve seemed intent on the danger, but as someone who fancied himself pretty logical and skeptical, I brushed it off. One Friday evening, after our usual work hours, a group of us decided to have some beers by a small fire pit we set up near our campsite. Typical employment banter filled the air until laughter bubbled up as we shared crude jokes. But eventually, the mood got darker as someone broached the subject of the hollow. Steve went into even more detail this time. According to him, People who'd been victims of this mystery assailant either ended up brutally maimed or, worse, dead, with their bodies found with horrifying injuries, almost like they'd been shredded apart. Now, whether it was the alcohol or the way Steve told it with such conviction, something felt different about all this and made me uneasy. But still, being pretty hammered dulled my fears enough to push them aside. Fast forward to the following Sunday, when I had nothing better to do. I decided to venture out for a walk alone in those infamous woods, still curious despite feeling completely sober and rational now. The sunlight sifted through leaves overhead as I made my way deeper and until it began fading. My thoughts were lost in that mysterious state where you can't really put your finger on what your mind is contemplating. I didn't realize how far I had wandered and eventually noticed that I was closing in on the area Steve had mentioned, the hollow. Given my fascination with debunking myths and legends, I figured it'd be interesting to investigate and prove him wrong. Out of nowhere, I heard a loud snap followed by an echoing groan coming from the trees just ahead of me. Trying not to freak out already. I ventured closer to see what it could be. Even though I was scared shitless at this point, my skepticism weighed heavier than my fear. Nicotine longings eventually took over, and despite the uneasy environment, I decided to light a cigarette while waiting to see if there was any further movement. The match flared up in the low light for a moment before being snuffed out by the wind, when suddenly, there it was a massive creature silhouetted by the moon's glow. 
Its eyes gleamed with a chilling malevolence as it stared me down. It was unlike anything I'd seen before, part human, part animal, hulking and predatory while maintaining an eerie intelligence. It felt like this thing didn't just want to hurt me. It wanted me to know that it could hurt me and had every intention of doing so. It hung back for a moment, then leapt at me with alarming speed. I bolted like a gazelle being chased by a lion, adrenaline overriding every other feeling in my body until my lungs screamed for air. Scrambling over branches and rocks, trying to dodge this predatory nightmare hot on my heels, wasn't really my plan for the evening, but at least it was better than becoming an appetizer for some godforsaken monster. A hand grabbed onto my shoulder, yanking me back, and I instinctively threw my fist at whatever was behind me. Steve's head jerked back as my knuckles connected with his jaw. Things didn't feel so jovial anymore. What the hell, man? He shouted in a mix of anger and concern. I was panting, speechless, and looking back in the direction I came from to see if the creature was still in pursuit but there was no sign. I started babbling about what I'd seen, and slowly an uncomfortable silence descended on our little drinking circle. They glanced at one another with an unsettling mix of fear and skepticism, trying to make sense of the maniacal rant i just spewed. At that point, some part of my brain started to put pieces together but it felt like desperately trying to hold on to sand as it slipped through my fingers. Our conversation eventually turned to a story, one that the local kids would tell around campfires and in the darkest corners of their bedrooms at sleepovers. The story of someone who prowled these very woods, someone who had once been a man but had been affected by some unnatural force. They called him the Wraith Walker, a grotesque figure who stalked unseen through the shadows of our sleepy town's forests. I guess they had all laughed it off before as a horror tale to scare each other shitless during dark nights, cruel amusement for bored teenagers. But now, with my account of what I'd witnessed fresh in their minds, that old ghost story seemed all too real. We couldn't shake the feeling that we ought to do something. But what could we report? To the police, our claims would only be seen as baseless paranoia or perhaps worse, a group of young people high or drunk and playing pranks. On Friday evening around 8.23 p.m., just 48 hours after I'd first encountered the Wraith Walker, a chilling scream shattered the calm night air. It was the sharp wail of a woman in pain or terror. As one, we sprang into action, fueled by concern and refusing to ignore such cries for help in our little town. We raced towards the sound, recklessly crashing through bushes and shoving branches out of our paths as if chased by death itself. When we found her, Sarah Mitchell, she was lying crumpled on the forest floor, her right arm twisting unnaturally beneath her body. Around her neck blossomed an ugly ring of angry purple bruises, marking where she had been grasped and choked. As she wept in relief when our frantic group surrounded her, she stammered fearfully, claiming it had been the Wraith Walker. As we helped Sarah up and began to guide her back to safety and civilization, Steve glanced over at an old, rundown cabin. A creaking sign stamped into the wooden frame read, Cabin of Elijah Mason. The name triggered some faint memory in Steve's mind of a man who had gone missing decades ago while traversing these same woods. Some claimed he'd been a hermit, seeking solace in his isolated cabin away from human contact, until one day he succumbed to an unknown darkness. Now, with every step we took away from that seemingly cursed place and closer to home, back in the direction of our normal lives, I found myself increasingly consumed by the notion that we no longer held much power over the events that might be waiting to unfold around us. 
after what I'd encountered just days ago, how could any of us ever feel safe again? As I walked alongside Sarah, newly bruised and forever changed by her experience, I knew deep down in my gut that whatever Elijah Mason had become after disappearing into those woods was anything but human. We were lucky this time. We found Sarah before it was too late. But how could we protect ourselves or anyone else in our little town from this monstrous wraith walker that now prowled our darkest nightmares? I constantly wondered, could there be peace for any of us again? Or were we doomed to live under a shroud of fear as reality crumbled around us? And moreover, would I ever know whether that malevolent face I saw on that first night belonged to the cursed visage of a tormented Elijah Mason? Some questions are better left unanswered, but as long as the Wraith Walker continues stalking our forests unseen, we shall never truly rest easy. So here I am now, passing on my story, the tale of the Wraith Walker, with a word of warning. Don't ever think you're completely safe from the darkness that may hide just beyond the trees. It was a slow afternoon when the first thought thing happened. I was at work on my reservation, helping put together a new exhibit at our cultural center. I'm a curator for the local Native American Museum, and my days usually consist of going through records, verifying artifacts, and maintaining exhibits. Oh right, my name is Jake. And I guess you could say I've got a pretty great sense of humor under this stoic exterior. I remember having a conversation with a coworker about how sometimes life on the res could feel monotonous when suddenly we heard this strange scraping noise coming from outside the building. Our joke-telling banter halted as we looked at each other in confusion. Probably just a car dragging something, he suggested, shrugging it off. But the sound persisted, and curiosity got the better of us. Together, we made our way outside to figure out what was causing such an unusual racket. As we stepped out into the courtyard, I couldn't help but notice how eerily quiet it was, aside from that one scraping sound. Then I spotted it. At first glance, it looked like a mound of dirt being dragged slowly along the ground by some unseen force. But then I saw blood mixed in with the soil and bits of torn clothing caught on branches. My coworker and I exchanged horrified glances before approaching with extreme caution. The closer we got, the more obvious it became that there was something very wrong about this situation. As we reached the grotesque mass of dirt and gore, I noticed what seemed like human limbs protruding from it, an arm here, an ankle there, all covered in scratches and bruises as if they'd been forcibly dragged over rough terrain. What kind of sick joke was this? I reached down to touch one of those mangled limbs when another sound pierced the stillness, a low growl that seemed to come from deep within the pile itself resonating throughout the entire courtyard. Before I even had a chance to react, the mound of dirt and flesh heaved up, exposing a terrifying figure. It was humanoid, but it was larger than any man I'd ever seen, muscular and covered in a mix of soil and dried blood. Its eyes were black as night and echoed with ancient malice. My colleague screamed, dropping to his knees in shock, while I felt my legs turn to jelly. We'd stumbled upon something far more sinister than a mundane prank here on the reservation. I can only guess that our assailant was an evil spirit from Native American folklore. We tried to fend it off by throwing rocks or anything else we could find, just trying to survive this horrific encounter but it only seemed to enrage this malign being further. As we attempted an escape, I saw that it was not satisfied with just one attack. 
It tore through bystanders who had come outside due to the commotion, shredding them mercilessly with its black alone hands. The gore was unbelievable. Lives were stolen away so violently. Our hearts raced and adrenaline pumped through every vein as we were forced into unthinkable decisions that would forever haunt us. The panic was consuming us, but we couldn't stop running through the darkness. My colleague and I sprinted towards the reservation's community center, where sounds of horror echoed throughout the halls. Huddled in a corner was a group of surviving onlookers, each one trembling with fear. Among them was an aging Native American elder named White Bear, who appeared to have a glimmer of understanding about what just happened. Visibly shaken, I approached him and asked, What was that thing? Why did it come after us? White Bear took a deep breath and whispered, Atanohiho. It means a vengeful spirit among our tribe. You have awakened it with your presence here. But we didn't do anything, I cried. Our people believe that the mere act of stepping on sacred grounds can summon spirits as powerful as Atanohiho, he explained solemnly. This land has known much bloodshed, and now the spirits seek their revenge. As he spoke, his voice cracked with regret and sorrow for what had taken place. The rest of the survivors looked at us with a mixture of fear and helplessness. Is there nothing we can do? asked my colleague desperately. I'm afraid Adonohiho cannot be stopped until it exacts its full vengeance, replied White Bear. We knew that we were trapped within the reservation's boundaries, unable to escape from this relentless evil spirit. But time ran out too quickly for any kind of reasonable plan. With our minds working double time trying to come up with some sort of solution or idea to placate this vengeful spirit, we did the only thing we could think of. We gathered everyone in the community center to offer words of apology and condolences to the lost souls over which Atanohiho presided. In that moment of intense vulnerability, I feared the nightmare would continue, but something remarkable happened. As the last of our contrite words poured forth, a cloud began to lift from the reservation. The world around us became eerily calm once again, and the night air was filled with a serene, otherworldly quality. It seemed that Atanohiho had heard our pleas and chosen mercy. At the break of dawn, we left the reservation. The memories of that horrendous night still echo within us to this day, an undeniable reminder and testament to the price that must sometimes be paid for trespassing on lands steeped in blood and history. As my colleague and I moved on with our lives, it was nigh impossible to shake the encounter with such ancient malevolence that had left so much death and destruction in its wake. But that experience changed us each fundamentally, forever mindful of boundaries we should not cross and of terrible histories long forgotten by many but far from silenced in the ages old whispers of the spirits themselves. Whatever peace we found moving forward was tempered by a chilling certainty. Atunohiho exists even now, lurking in the shadows of its haunted domain. To this day, we remain survivors who cannot forget those harrowing hours or escape the terror that once engulfed us all, imprisoned by knowledge few others possess. In hushed conversations of fear and gratitude, we forever honor those who fell beneath Adonohiho's wrathful gaze as a reminder of their mournful legacy, eager for justice but perhaps finding solace in the remorse and respect we carried away with us from those haunted grounds. I've always been a sucker for making bets, and it's gotten me into some rather peculiar situations. You'd think I'd learned my lesson by now, but nope. Anyhow, 
That's how I found myself deep into the woods of Desolation Canyon, a place so gloomy even the birds don't sing, and a sort of darkness clings to everything. Working as a park ranger does have its perks. At least I knew the landscape well enough to keep myself out of worse trouble. But looking around, I couldn't shake off the feeling that something was off kilter. It was Tuesday, June 26, 2012, a day I won't forget any time soon. My buddy Travis and I were out on a routine patrol in the canyon when we stumbled upon some campers who had taken bets on which one of us could stay out in the forest the longest. Being ever competitive and having an unhealthy addiction to coffee, I saw an opportunity for something more fun than our mundane daily grind. Our bet took on new complexities when Travis declared a rather quirky clause during said challenge. Either side would drink any caffeine. How cruel can one man be? Nevertheless, we shook hands, sealing our fate for one night that would go awry in more ways than I cared to count. As dusk began to settle over the dense tree line, Travis suddenly stopped. He pointed out something strange lying on the ground. It looked like strands of thick black hair. As we moved further into the woods, we realized there were larger clumps strewn about haphazardly. The more we searched, a sense of unease settled over us as we kept finding these large tufts. It reminded me of something I saw years before during my first year as a ranger. Those pesky hairs belonged to no animal native to these parts. Grudgingly admitting defeat just after midnight since either of us had ever actually intended to spend the whole night camping, we headed back towards the station. But all of a sudden, we heard an unearthly howl echoing in the canyon, freezing our spines and setting our hearts pounding. I figured it was some pranksters or teenagers having fun, but Travis's wide eyes warned me not to be too hasty in dismissing the threat. Another howl ripped through the forest, closer this time and accompanied by the unmistakable sound of heavy footfalls. The ground shook beneath our feet as whatever approach moved faster and grew nearer. Now scared witless and not really in the mood for banter, my mind raced through a panicked inventory of horrifying creatures that haunted my childhood nightmares. As Travis and I stood there, Trembling with adrenalized fear, it dawned on us both that we couldn't outrun whatever was coming. Then suddenly, bursting from behind a cluster of trees no more than twenty yards away, came this creature. It stood at least eight feet tall, covered in coarse black hair from head to toe, with razor-sharp claws on its gnarled hands. But worst of all was its yellow-eyed glare which seemed to pierce every fiber of my being. The guttural growl it produced as it charged towards us sent another shudder down our spines. Knowing there was no chance of fighting this monstrous beast off with just our bare hands or minimal equipment, I made an impossible decision. Throwing caution to the wind, and not wanting Travis's last memory of me to be dripping with cowardice, I tackled the colossal creature head-on. I felt overwhelming terror coursing through me as those massive claws sliced through the air mere inches from my face, hot breath assailing my nostrils. Just as I thought my life was about to end, Travis sprang into action with surprising speed and determination. He hurled a rock the size of a football at the creature's head momentarily knocking it off balance and giving me a window of opportunity to regroup. I noticed a nearby fallen tree branch that seemed like an adequate weapon. Grabbing it, I swung with all my might, connecting it to the creature's side. The blow elicited a pained growl from the beast, but it wasn't enough to subdue it. Distract it! Travis cried out as he scrambled up a tree for higher ground. As I lured the beast away from him by dodging its attacks, Travis managed to break off a large branch, 
which he then used as a makeshift spear. Get down! He yelled as he hurled the sharp spear at the monster. It struck the creature right in the shoulder, making it scream in both pain and rage. In that moment, I had an idea. Travis, I shouted, the hairs we found! They're like some kind of breadcrumb trail. It must be using them to navigate. His eyes widened in shock but quickly filled with understanding. You're right, he whispered tensely before rolling out of the way of another vicious swipe from the angry beast. As we evaded the monster's relentless attacks, we devised a plan to follow the trail marked by those ominous black hairs back to where this nightmare began. Pushing through fatigue and terror and narrowly avoiding several deadly swipes from those monstrous claws, we raced back through the woods until we stumbled upon the creature's lair. Upon arrival, we saw what appeared to be crude drawings on the walls and several piles of animal bones scattered around. In those drawings was our answer. This creature was called Kurakungra. An old indigenous legend used to explain strange disappearances and ominous howls heard in this very canyon. It was said that the creature would take on human-like characteristics while living deep within the forest. As the monstrous beast pursued us to its lair, we knew that trapping it there was our only chance to stop these horrors. I grabbed a nearby torch and thrust it into the dry leaves and debris scattered around its dwelling. Flames spread, encircling Kurakungra. The creature growled and snarled in a feral display of pain and anger, but it was trapped in the voracious blaze we'd ignited. As the inferno roared higher, we cautiously retreated, knowing our victory would only last as long as the fire's rage. In the days following our harrowing encounter with Kurakungra, we kept silent about our experience. We knew that no one would believe us. An escaped creature like that from local legends was too much to grasp for most people. But every now and then, when we hear an eerie howl echo through Desolation Canyon, we remember those unforgettable events that have forever scarred our minds and souls. We know Kurakungra is out there, waiting for its chance to prey on others. And so do we, always vigilant, always watching, lest history dare repeat itself in those cursed woods. I was in Vermont's Birchwood Forest at the time completely enamored with the dizzying variety of plant species that made up its delicate ecosystem. My name is Devante Freeland, and I had come to this sylvan paradise with a group of friends to take our minds off some issues that were going on at school. It was the 16th of June, 2008. During this trip, we joked around and even dabbled in some friendly banter that could only result from friendship forged over years. While laughing with my best friend Cassius, I couldn't help but notice an odd twitch in his eye as he told a particularly raunchy joke about a kangaroo and a mime artist. As the sun dipped lower in the sky, we decided to set up camp near a scenic creek surrounded by thick vegetation. That's when my friend, Juniper Lawrence, noticed something unusual about the twisted branches overhead. They seemed to coil and shape into humanoid figures, contorted bodies stretched out, almost as if they were eternally yearning for release from their wooden prisons. Not long after that discovery, we gathered around a crackling fire while Juniper strummed random notes on her guitar. Just when the atmosphere started to feel light and carefree again, we heard something unsettling, an unnerving howl echoing from somewhere deep within the woods. At first glance, it seemed as though our night would remain uneventful. Jokes exchanged, beers consumed amid pleasant discussions about nothing in particular. But then we felt a sudden drop in temperature, 
accompanied by an unshakable sense of dread creeping across our skin like invisible spiders scattering swiftly over every exposed inch. Suddenly, my awareness shifted towards something standing about twenty feet away. An almost human figure stooped low and shrouded by darkness. It had unnervingly long limbs with sharp claws at their endpoints. Saliva dripped from its maw while its eyes appeared almost white in their malice. I could barely keep my wits about me as the creature skulked closer and closer with each deliberate, bone-chilling step. The noise from our fire seemed to vanish completely, leaving a dreadful silence as I tried vigorously to remain numb to my mounting terror. As the abomination reached the clearing's edge and prepared for its savage assault, it was then that we discovered its monstrous intent. With startling ferocity, it lunged at Juniper, saliva-laden jaws clamped around her arm, tearing flesh and spraying blood chaotically across our horrified faces. The cacophony of screams was swiftly drowned out by the vile guttural growls emanating from this atrocious aggressor. Panicked beyond belief, we fought back with whatever weapons lay nearby, tent stakes and burning sticks hastily yanked from the sputtering fire pit. But every strike seemed only to enrage the creature further. Cassius howled with newfound fury as it swiped a violent arc across his chest, ripping apart his favorite rancid t-shirt and drawing thick crimson lines beneath. We roared with equal venom as we continued beating relentlessly on this seemingly invulnerable monster. Then, in a last-ditch attempt to neutralize our attacker, I grabbed a can of lighter fluid from our supply pile and doused it in an area close to the creature. As my trembling fingertips struck the flint of my trusty lighter for one fleeting spark, the fire roared back to life, engulfing the creature in an inferno. Flames licked at its revolting skin, unleashing an ear-shattering wail that motivated every cell in my body to flee. We scrambled for our belongings and sprinted into the woods, leaving a screaming juniper behind. The forest blurred into a jumble of branches and leaves as we tore through it, gasping for breath and hearts pounding. A thought plagued me. How could something so vicious and repulsive exist? It felt like we had encountered something beyond the boundaries of comprehension, a dark entity manifested from our deepest fears. As we ran, I could hear my friends sobbing and whimpering, their sanity hanging by a thread. The creature's monstrous howls chased us relentlessly through the night. Fear consumed me with every step, and I couldn't shake the image of Juniper's mangled arm gushing with blood her life essence spilling onto the ground like discarded waste. We finally stumbled upon a secluded cabin by a small lake. As Cassius swung open the door, and we piled inside like frightened children, I noticed the scars on his chest still oozing with blood from the beast's attacks while adrenaline coursed through me. The eerie silence that followed was unbearable. It spoke volumes of dread and despair. Time stretched out in front of us like an endless chasm as we weighed our options. A rifle hung above the fireplace. It was our only hope against such an abomination. Though none of us had much experience handling firearms, we decided to take turns keeping watch, armed with that gun as our protector. Four hours after that fateful encounter, we took turns watching from the cabin window for any signs of movement in the moonlit landscape and nursing wounds sustained during our desperate fight back at camp. The lines between fear and numbness started to blur as exhaustion kicked in. Around 3 a.m., it was my turn to stand guard. Peering out the window, I noticed a ripple in the smooth water of the lake. The panic started to creep in again. What if that thing had followed our scent? What if it hadn't satisfied its malevolent cravings yet? The ripples grew larger, and from the depths emerged a figure dripping with water. It was Juniper, 
her eyes crazed but alive. She limped towards the cabin with a primal ferocity that sent shivers down my spine. Her arm was nothing more than shredded flesh and gore dangling around her blood-soaked clothing. We opened the door to let her in when she snarled with uncontained aggression. Overcome by the insanity of the situation, I grabbed the rifle and aimed it at Juniper's maddened stare, or whatever monstrous force had taken control of my friend. The gunshot echoed through the night, its harsh sound carried by the freezing wind across the desolate landscape. Juniper's body crumpled to the ground, an eerie mixture of relief and heartache washing over me. As we huddled together in that forsaken cabin, not knowing whether we would make it out alive, our only comfort came from embracing each other, desperate for solace amidst unimaginable terror. In those final hours before dawn, I realized that what we had encountered that night would never truly leave us. One by one, we would have to confront our own beasts, manifestations of every darkness lurking within us. And as long as we were bound together by love and friendship, maybe, just maybe, we would have a fighting chance against them. However, deep inside, I knew that no matter how hard we tried to move on with our lives or how much we clung to hope and camaraderie, there would always be an eerie reminder of that treacherous evening, a distant howl echoing through the night, a starved creature impatiently awaiting its next prey. I first noticed it while working as a paramedic in a small town in New Mexico. It was a sweltering July morning, and I had been on duty all night, picking up people with heat stroke and dehydration due to the overwhelming heat wave our region had been experiencing. Everyone in town was on edge, and the intense weather wasn't making things any easier. My partner, Lucy, and I were dispatched to an abandoned house on Fletcher Street, a well-known drug hangout. Dispatch told us there was an unresponsive man at the location, most likely from an overdose. Although we had seen our fair share of overdoses in our time, this one felt different from the moment we arrived. The strange smell emanating from the house, a mixture of decay and something else we just couldn't put a finger on, sent shivers down our spines. Silently exchanging looks filled with apprehension and determination, Lucy and I donned gloves, grabbed our equipment bags, and slowly made our way inside the decrepit structure. The crumbling walls allowed slivers of sunlight to pierce through, creating an eerie atmosphere that made us feel as if we were trespassing in some forbidden territory. The unresponsive man lay sprawled under a graffiti-covered wall near what used to be the living room. He seemed average enough, nothing out of the ordinary other than his gray pallor and shallow breathing, telltale signs of an opiate overdose. As I prepared my four supplies and naloxone to administer in hopes of reviving him before his heart stopped for good, I noticed something strange scratch marks on the floor that started near the unconscious man's feet. Lucy noticed the two and traced them with her eyes before turning her attention back to me. However, either of us could bring ourselves to voice what we were really thinking. It almost seemed like he had been dragged into this position by someone. Or something. Shaking the notion from my mind, I administered the medication and we watched as the man slowly came to life. His shallow breaths deepened, and color returned to his face. After stabilizing the patient, who seemed confused and terrified by his surroundings, Lucy and I exchanged looks filled with confusion about what had transpired in that house. It became clear that this wasn't our usual drug call, not by a long shot. As we walked back to the ambulance, a voice suddenly caught our attention. It was a shrill cackle coming from behind us, 
accompanied by what sounded like rapid footsteps scurrying away. Instinctively jerking our heads towards the noise, we saw a glimpse of something lean and hideous running into the darkness of an adjacent alleyway, too fast to make out more than its tangled black hair and sharp claws. In that instant, it was irrelevant if our patient had survived or not. Something far more sinister was at play that day than drug abuse. As word spread about the unusual flat where we found the man passed out from drugs while dragged into an unknown location, together with an unseen, monstrous creature no one believed in, everyone in the small town was on edge. There were whispers and theories of a skinwalker preying upon the vulnerable. Fear took hold of our community. The crime investigation went unsolved for months until one day something happened while at work. My partner and I got called out once again for another overdose case, but this time things were very different from before. When we arrived at another abandoned building to rescue yet another junkie almost dead from narcotics, one thing stuck out predominantly, clawed footprints surrounding the man who seemed familiar except they were imprinted on walls rather than on dirt. We couldn't shake the feeling that something was off about those clawed footprints. They were unlike anything we had seen before. The man we found, pale and barely breathing, didn't even seem to notice the bizarre marks all around him. As we treated him for his overdose, I noticed a crumpled piece of paper in his hand. He muttered something and weakly handed it to me. I unfolded the paper to find a drawing of a terrifying creature with animal-like features but large and bipedal like a human, something similar to what people described as a skinwalker or Bigfoot. The next day, my partner and I went to speak with the local sheriff, who was also baffled by the clawed footprints. He suggested we talk to an individual named Daniel who lived on the outskirts of town and had apparently witnessed something unnatural. When we arrived at his house, Daniel seemed hesitant at first but eventually opened up about his encounter. He described seeing a large, humanoid creature with the ability to change its shape into an animal. He called it a skinwalker. We listened to Daniel's story skeptically but couldn't help getting more interested as he provided explicit details about its physical appearance, movements, and sounds. The more he talked, the more on edge we felt. With each passing hour, more people came forward, claiming they'd seen this creature lurking in the shadows outside their homes or heard its eerie calls in the night. Realizing that there may be something sinister lurking in our town, I organized an emergency meeting between law enforcement officers and some of the people who had encountered it. We tried to figure out how best to protect ourselves from this insidious threat that seemed determined to wreak havoc on us. Days turned into nights as people reported hearing scratches on their doors and windows or seeing shadowy figures slipping through alleyways. The fear was palpable. No one knew when or where the skinwalker might strike. Then, three days after we found the man with the mysterious clawed footprints, another attack occurred. An elderly lady was found in her home, bloodied and bruised, barely clinging to life. A neighbor had overheard her screaming and rushed in to save her. From her hospital bed, she recounted a chilling tale. She claimed to have woken up in the middle of the night to see a creature standing by her bed, one that looked eerily similar to the Bigfoot described by Daniel. The town was now living its worst nightmare. Everyone feared that they would be next. The sheriff and his deputies decided to form a watch group in an effort to investigate and hopefully contain whatever was causing this case. Days went by but despite our best efforts, no significant breakthrough was made. The creature seemed to always be one step ahead of us, its presence haunting our once peaceful town. 
When all hope seemed lost, we received word of a new witness who had taken photographs of the creature from a distance. As we examined these blurry photos, one detail became apparent. It appeared that the skinwalker was often near abandoned buildings or homes with known drug users. We suddenly realized that this cursed monster had been deliberately preying on vulnerable individuals who succumbed to addiction. With this knowledge in hand, a civilian group formed, at their own risk, to keep an eye on abandoned buildings and known drug hotspots non-stop. Over time, fewer sightings were reported, until eventually none at all. The creepy feeling that used to blanket the town began to slowly fade away. Life slowly returned to normal. Still, people couldn't help but glance nervously over their shoulders when walking down a dark alley or visiting an abandoned building. Today, which marks six months since our last incident with the skinwalker or Bigfoot-like creature, I occasionally wonder if it will ever come back or if we've driven it away for good. The town still talks about those horrifying days in hushed tones, and every so often, someone swears they've seen a shadow that wasn't quite human-like, making us all question if it's ever truly gone. Working as a search and rescue officer for the United States Forest Service, I've had my fair share of strange missions. But none could compare to what I experienced during a routine search operation on the outskirts of Mammoth Cave National Park, situated in Kentucky. Instead of friends sharing stories around a campfire that night, an otherworldly turn of events quickly unfolded. It all began when I received word about three missing hikers who had not returned from their trek around the park's legendary cave systems. Concerned for their well-being, my team and I hastily set out to find them before nightfall. However, nothing could have prepared us for the grisly scene awaiting us at their base campsite. As we approached the area, Gaping tents and scattered personal belongings dangling from surrounding trees greeted us with a chilling sense of chaos. The ravenous air of despairing silence lay heavily over the chilling events that had taken place there. As we assessed the disarray, the faintest aroma of raw meat wafted through, causing our stomachs to churn in nauseating discomfort. Determined to recover the hikers or find any clues regarding their present whereabouts, we split up into smaller groups and began scouring deeper into the wooden abyss. My partner and I ventured toward a nearby cave entrance, where we discovered something that still haunts me to this day. There, lying halfway between shadow and light, were human spinal columns crudely stitched together to form a grotesque string of macabre decorations. The shocking sight instilled in us an overwhelming sense of dread as we now comprehended the merciless adversary we were up against. My gut clenched as I reluctantly radioed our find back to base. I could feel their disbelief through the static crackling airwaves. Despite this gruesome discovery, we pressed on with our search, focused on bringing closure to these hikers' loved ones. What seemed like hours passed as we made our way deeper into the cave network, and the air grew colder the further we ventured. In the narrow beam of our flashlights, we caught a glimpse of blood splatters that appeared to be dripping upwards from pointy stalactites or even floating and congealing in midair. Suddenly, we heard a low, guttural growl echoing throughout the cave. As we turned the corner, our lights fell on a figure lurking in the darkness. It stood tall and skeletal, with elongated limbs that extended from its twisted spine. Razor-sharp antlers pierced through tufts of matted hair on its head as it lunged toward us. Our instincts kicked in as the adrenaline coursed through our veins. I pulled out my gun and fired a few shots, 
barely grazing its grotesque frame. It recoiled at the sound but didn't appear wounded or deterred. Realizing the ineffectiveness of our weapons against this nightmarish entity, my partner and I made a split-second decision to make our retreat. As we dashed back through the cave system with that monstrous figure hot on our heels, our desperate flight came to an abrupt halt. To our horror, we stumbled upon a gruesome scene. Human carcasses littered across the cavern's damp floor, remnants of what seemed like their previous struggles somehow tattooed upon their flesh. I looked back to see those cold, emotionless eyes gazing at me with ruthless intent. Time seemed to slow down as I desperately tried to process my next move. Without a moment's hesitation, I grabbed my partner's arm, and we sprinted in the opposite direction of the creature, our hearts pounding in our chests. Desperate thoughts filled my mind as we darted through the cave, trying to navigate around the jagged stalagmites and stalactites, knowing that one wrong step could mean certain death. As we continued our frantic escape, I heard footsteps reverberating behind us. The creature's rancid breath lingered in the air, getting closer and closer. My partner glanced at me, his face a mask of terror. We need to reach the cave entrance, he shouted. Just when it seemed like all hope was lost, I remembered the flare gun I had tucked into my backpack. Fumbling around, I grabbed the device, aimed it towards the approaching monster, and fired. The sudden burst of light and sound disoriented the creature just enough for us to gain some distance. As we raced toward the exit, we noticed a traveler who had stumbled upon our gruesome scene. He immediately scrambled away from danger while flashing his flashlight at us. We need your help. I yelled to him as we moved closer. He nodded hesitantly as he joined us in our escape. I've heard stories about that thing. They call it Gorgon. He gasped. The locals have been encountering it for decades now. Together, we reached the entrance of the cave, barely ahead of Gorgon's relentless pursuit. The bitter cold embraced us as we stumbled outside into the snow. Wait, shouted our newfound ally. He pulled something out of his bag, dynamite. What are you going to do with that? My partner asked incredulously. I'm hoping this will buy us some time, replied the traveler, fear etched onto his face. He lit its fuse and tossed it back toward the cave entrance just as Gorgon emerged from the darkness. The explosion rocked the area causing a massive collapse and burying the creature beneath countless tons of rock and ice. We didn't wait to see if it would break free, choosing instead to help each other back to camp. As we shivered around a fire with cups of hot coffee, our new friend officially introduced himself as Seth. He told us more about Gorgon's haunting lore, how it terrorized those who dared venture too close feasting on their fear and leaving only chaos behind. We agreed to notify authorities about the hikers' fates in the morning, but none of U.S. could shake the constant paranoia that Gorgon had somehow survived and would be seeking revenge at any moment. As I lay awake in our tent that night, I couldn't help but glance at every sound through the canvas. The wind howled violently outside but a darker feeling of dread gnawed at my gut, warning me that rest might prove even more perilous this night. Suddenly, I heard uneven footsteps approaching our campsite. My heart raced as I secretly hoped it was just another member of our search team returning late from their own grim discoveries. Sliding my knife from its sheath slowly, I crept closer to the tent flap when an unnerving thought came to me, what if Gorgon had escaped? What unspeakable terror awaited us? And would we ever truly escape this living nightmare?
I've always thought of myself as a logical, down-to-earth person. In fact, my friends often tease me for being the most rational of the bunch. But if there's one thing living in Alaska has taught me, it's that even the most grounded people can find their sense of reality rattled. It happened during a six-month work assignment in Anchorage, where I was tasked with overseeing a small team of researchers studying the migration patterns of salmon. I moved into a charming little rental house bordering the Tony Knowles Coastal Trail and was immediately taken by the breathtaking scenery. With dense forests on one side and beautiful vistas overlooking the mudflats on the other, it was a picturesque setting that seemed to encapsulate Alaska's wild beauty. Coming home from work late one evening, I decided to take a walk on the trail to clear my head and relax. The sun had just dipped below the horizon, casting an orange-bronze glow across the landscape. The air felt crisp against my skin and carried a distinctive scent unique to this part of the world. As I rounded a bend in the path, something caught my eye near an old wooden bench by the side of the trail. It was a small pile of something. Intrigued, I approached cautiously. The mounting dread in my stomach tightened with each step as I realized those were human fingers strewn about on and around the bench. Panicking, I whipped out my phone and called 911 while backing away from the disturbing sight. Within minutes, local law enforcement arrived and secured the area. My mind raced while officers questioned me. Who or what could have done this? No names came to mind. Only vivid descriptions. Tall with lanky limbs. Intense eyes staring at me from darkened corners. Over time, more incidents occurred. Unexpected disappearances. More body parts discovered along roads and wooded trails alike. Every account seemed to leave out any clues and no one seemed to catch a glimpse of the perpetrator. Locals whispered in hushed tones and steered clear of coastal trails after dark. A particularly troubling account came from a distressed motorist who claimed that an unnervingly tall figure had stepped in front of his vehicle late one night while driving on a secluded road. He described how it grinned with an impossibly wide, malicious smile before disappearing into thin air, an unsettling story that sent shivers down my spine. As tensions mounted throughout the community, I found myself attending a neighborhood meeting where concerned citizens shared their experiences and fears. It was evident that everyone's nerves were frayed and suspicions ran high all fueled by blurry descriptions of sinister grins and piercing eyes lurking amidst the shadows. Despite the rising panic, I remained skeptical. After all, surely there must be some rational explanation for these frightening events. Perhaps a disturbed individual or group was responsible for this reign of terror. Rumor had it that someone caught glimpses of this mysterious figure a potential suspect behind the gruesome chaos. Yet, though we all tried to wrap our minds around this possibility, every little noise outside had our hearts pounding. Trusting my logical instincts, I convinced myself that these explanations were plausible. I continued enjoying my evening walks along the Tony Knowles Coastal Trail while exercising extra caution. After all, Alaska is known for its big bears, local predators that were just as dangerous, if not more so, than any human antagonist. Yet one evening, things changed. As I strolled along the now eerily quiet trail, something caught my eye in the distance. A tall figure stood motionless with eyes locked onto mine and wearing a wide, malicious smile. Its lanky limbs reached out toward me, as if it wanted to snatch me up then and there. I knew I had to act fast. Instead of running away, I decided to approach the figure calmly, trying not to show fear. As I inched closer, 
My former suspicions of the figure being the one behind the gruesome chaos seemed more valid than ever. This person, if it indeed was a person, wore tattered clothes hanging off their skeletal frame. Unkempt hair covered portions of their faces, but the visible skin was sickly pale. I decided to speak up with as much courage as I could muster. Who are you? I asked, hoping to get some answers before things escalated further. To my surprise, the figure began muttering under their breath before finally whispering a name. Marcus. Within moments of hearing the name Marcus, another person stumbled onto the trail from the nearby wooded area. He was in rough shape, beaten, bruised, and covered in dirt and dried blood. Oh my God! He gasped as he saw the figure in front of me. That's him. That's Marcus. Marcus' head snapped towards the injured man. Our eyes locked for what felt like an eternity before Marcus broke my gaze and sprinted in the direction of his apparent victim. I knew that if I didn't act now, this man would be just another sadistic addition to Marcus' twisted track record. My body kicked into action as I chased after the dangerous figure who disappeared into the darkness. I followed closely behind, not willing to give up even though my legs screamed for mercy. Then, suddenly Marcus was gone, vanished without a trace. The injured man who confirmed his identity fell into my arms exhausted and terrified. His breathing was labored and ragged. Thank you, he panted, gazing at me with wide eyes full of gratitude. We need to get you help, I said, helping him to his feet and retracing our steps back towards the trail. As we made our way back to the safety of civilization, the injured man introduced himself as Jean. He had encountered Marcus a few nights before while out for an evening run and had been held captive since then. Hearing his harrowing story, I grew even more determined to see Marcus brought to justice. After getting Jean checked into a hospital and notifying law enforcement, I spent the following days telling everyone I knew about what had happened on that trail. As stories of Marcus spread throughout the community, reports from others who crossed his path began emerging as well. The police had leads but were unable to locate Marcus. Nights turned into weeks, and there was still no sign of the mysterious figure that haunted Tony Knoll's coastal trail. Paranoia continued to grow within every person living in the area. The sound of footsteps is now a trigger that sends fear shooting through our veins. I knew that Marcus was still out there somewhere waiting for his next victim or for a chance to finish what he started with me or Jean. Though he did not strike again within those weeks, his clear intentions haunted my thoughts and dreams. And so it continues, an endless cycle of half-caught glimpses, whispered tales of terror, and sleepless nights praying that Marcus remains nothing more than a shrouded figure in the darkness. But as time goes on and no end is in sight, one question hangs over my consciousness. When will Marcus reappear? Is he waiting for another lone wanderer on the Tony Knoll's coastal trail? Only time will tell. Alaska is a place of breathtaking beauty. But beneath its pristine surface, something sinister was unfolding. I'm not one to believe in scary tales or legends, but what I experienced during my stay there was either ordinary nor could I have ever imagined it happening. It was summer in Fairbanks, Alaska, and the sun shining brightly for nearly 22 hours of the day made it feel like an almost endless adventure. I had always been a skeptic when it came to unexplained phenomena or even the notion of something otherworldly lurking just beyond our grasp. In fact, 
I often found amusement in debunking supernatural claims. During my time in Alaska, I worked as a geologist for a local mining company. One day, my coworker Tom and I were discussing the previous night's events, where he too had experienced something inexplicable. We shared our theories on what we might have encountered while laughing about the possibility of aliens watching us pick up rock samples all day. That same night, feeling braver than usual, I decided to visit the nearby river alone after dinner for some peace and quiet. But as soon as my feet touched the rocky banks of the water, a foul stench assaulted my nostrils. The smell was like rotting meat mixed with sewage, something utterly repulsive and hard to describe. Suddenly, I heard heavy footsteps behind me, as if someone or something was approaching fast. As I turned around to face whatever approached, an imposing figure lunged toward me from across the river bank. In a split second, it grabbed both of my wrists in an iron grip and hauled me closer to its grotesque and distorted features. Its skin seemed covered with gruesome scabs and oozing pus from various sores covering its body. The creature's breath was unbearable as it gazed with hollow eyes directly into my core, as if it could see right through me. I began to sweat profusely fearing for my life as I struggled to free myself from its grip. In a desperate attempt to escape, I kicked the creature squarely where a person's stomach would be. To my surprise, it released me and stumbled back, giving me just enough time to scramble away. It quickly recovered and chased after me, still lusting for something beyond my comprehension. As its horrifyingly disfigured face came closer with each passing second, part of me wanted to know what it wanted from me but instinctively knew that finding out would be the end of me. For hours, we raced through the treacherous Alaskan wilderness, always on the brink of capture. This relentless pursuit felt as if it would never end. However, it was about to take a sharp turn for the worse. As I scrambled through the dense vegetation, my legs suddenly gave out beneath me as I tumbled into a dark and bottomless abyss. As I fell, the putrid figure above didn't hesitate and leaped in after me, its rancid breath growing ever closer. Time seemed to slow down, allowing me to remember every horrifying detail of this ordeal, when suddenly, I landed on a pile of leaves with a thud and the sudden stop left me gasping for air. Despite the shock of landing in an unexpected cavern, I scrambled to get up, knowing that it was just a matter of time before the disfigured figure followed. A dim light flickered in the distance, turning my attention in that direction. As I picked up speed, moving towards the light source, I heard the terrifying thud of the monstrous antagonist landing behind me. Its intimidating footsteps matched my pace, and its ragged breath echoed through the underground chamber. Weaving between stalagmites and large boulders, I barely noticed a group of frightened people huddled together. Their wide-eyed expressions conveyed their terror as they watched our pursuit unfold. To my relief, one of them stepped forward and motioned for me to join him in a hidden alcove. Without hesitation, I slipped into the cramped space with him as the others remained hidden. The man frantically whispered to me that his name was Jared, and he had managed to evade the abhorrent creature for days now while he was stuck down here. He seemed to be an ordinary person who found himself trapped in this nightmarish situation. Jared's voice trailed off as we both heard the footsteps of our pursuer inching closer. A foul stench filled the air, like rotten eggs mixed with decaying flesh. Although we could not see it, we knew it was near, within arm's reach if we dared peek out from our hiding spot. We held our breaths as uneven scratching sounds passed by us, almost like claws scraping against stone before slowly fading away into silence, 
just for a moment. I couldn't understand how this terror struck us without any explanation or clear motivation. All I knew was that escaping this dreadful place was my only priority. Unfortunately, Jared's face turned white when he realized that escape would take a back seat to what we were now faced with. The cavern walls reverberated with a low, guttural growl that shook us to our cores, followed immediately by blood-curdling screams from innocent victims who managed to stumble into the creature's path. Their muffled cries echoed through the shadows, painting a visceral picture of their desperate, gory demise. Jared decided that we must act quickly as more screams filled our ears. We darted towards the flickering light, now barely visible amongst the chaos. My heart pounded in my chest, but there was no time to linger on emotions or feelings. Survival was all that mattered. As we reached the light, it turned out to be a narrow tunnel leading towards an uncertain future, but it was our only chance. With pure adrenaline pumping through us, we raced through twists and turns, praying that we were not just running into another dead end or, worse, straight into the jaws of the disfigured creature. To our surprise and relief, we stumbled upon an old ladder leading up what appeared to be a previously sealed maintenance shaft. It became our only chance for escape. Climbing with urgency, driven by pure instinct and dread, I felt the chilling breath of the creature against my foot as it lunged for me, just as I pulled myself up and slammed the hatch shut. Exhausted and panting heavily, Jared and I realized that somehow we had found ourselves back on the surface. We glanced at each other in shock and disbelief that fate had allowed us to survive. As we stumbled away from that nightmare-filled abyss, lost in thought about what just transpired beneath our feet, Jared looked back at me, clutching his left arm. With trepidation in his voice, he said, Everyone below! They called that thing the hollowed. We knew deep down that those who experienced the hollowed firsthand rarely lived to tell their tale. As we forged forward with the horrifying memories of our encounter etched into our minds, I silently wondered if the hollowed had truly let us go or whether we were merely escaping one nightmare, only to enter another, leaving everything unresolved and uncertain. As we turned away from the entrance to that horrible place and its tortured screams, promising each other that we would find a way to stop this nightmare and avenge the fallen, an eerie chill crept upon my spine. A reminder that the horrors below may yet walk among us in the not-too-distant future. A couple of years ago, my buddies and I decided to go on a weekend camping trip upstate. Despite the cynical remarks regarding how terrible life would be without Wi-Fi or Netflix for a weekend, we were all secretly excited about the opportunity to get out of the city and breathe some fresh air. Little did we know what we were getting ourselves into. We arrived at our campsite a beautiful clearing within an isolated forest. The sun was setting as we unloaded our gear and set up our tents, relieved to finally be in nature and away from the stress of day-to-day -day life. As night fell, we sat around the campfire, roasting hot dogs and swapping old stories, occasionally cracking up at some humiliating high school memory that one of us tried to forget. Man, do you remember the time Devin ran through the hallway naked just before the big game? Ryan asked cheekily. The poor guy still regrets drinking all that bourbon. I chuckled. It was around midnight when we suddenly heard what sounded like heavy footsteps in the distance. At first, we dismissed it as just one of us stepping away for a minute, but we couldn't shake off the feeling that something wasn't right. 
The sound carried a certain weight to it that didn't quite resemble human footsteps. It was almost like there were more than just two legs making contact with the ground. Trying to ignore the uneasiness growing among us, we continued talking and joking around until an unnerving howl echoed through the woods. We all froze, realizing this was something far different from your regular coyote yelp. The next morning, curiosity had gotten the better of us, so Dylan and I decided to investigate whatever had been lurking around our campsite last night. We quietly tracked down several canine-like footprints that were curiously larger than any coyote prints I had ever seen. As if on cue, Ryan seemed hesitant and quipped. You're not turning this into some cryptozoology hoax, right? Cause I didn't sign up for a werewolf hunting trip. Relax, man. We're just trying to figure out what caused those howls. It's probably just a big old dog that ran away from his leash. Dylan reassured him. That night, we put extra logs on the fire in hopes of warding off whatever creature had been disturbing us. I could see that even though everyone tried to brush it off as a wild animal, an air of unease still hung over the group. We decided to turn in early, hoping that tomorrow would bring some answers. In the dead of night, somewhere between sleep and consciousness, I heard the crunching of twigs and leaves nearby our campsite again. This time it was incredibly close. I could almost sense the creature breathing heavily outside our tent. It was nearly pitch black, but just as I peered out the small window flap, my heart sank. There it was, a menacing silhouette lurking by the edge of our campfire. Now I could see this thing, a giant cross between a wolf and a human. I instinctively began to shake my friends awake, desperately trying to avoid alerting the beasts outside my tent with any sudden movements. The heavy steps grew closer and louder, and I felt a gut-wrenching terror sweep through me like never before. Just when we thought it impossible to avoid an inevitable confrontation with this horrifying being, in a frenzy of panic, I managed to whisper urgently, Guys, it's here. It's outside the tent. Their eyes widened as they tried to stifle their fear and keep quiet. We huddled together, hearts pounding, dreading the inevitable. As the creature approached our tent, we could hear soft growls echoing from its throat. The fire had long since gone out, and we were left in complete darkness. At 2.12 a.m., we heard a gut-churning sound as the beast tore through our supplies just a few feet away from us. It seemed to be searching for something. But then, just as suddenly as it began, it stopped. The growls and ripping noises ceased, replaced only by heavy breathing. It seemed to realize that what it was searching for wasn't there perhaps because it was sitting right there with us in the tent. Casting aside all my fears, I knew I had to take action before we were picked off one by one. I grabbed my Swiss Army knife in one hand and whispered my plan to my friends in short sentences in a barely audible voice. They nodded their agreement. They understood that this was our only chance if we wanted to survive this nightmare. Risking our lives in a split-second decision at 2.28 a.m., we burst out of the tent simultaneously, screaming at the top of our lungs and waving anything we had in our hands, sticks and knives alike, to frighten the creature. Its menacing appearance was more horrifying than I could have imagined. Standing taller than any human being and covered in thick gray fur, it recoiled at our very presence. And yet... As we created chaos around it while staying away from its long claws dripping with blood from tearing apart our belongings earlier, it slowly began to retreat from us, displaying confusion rather than anger like we expected. At this point, all hope seemed lost as two more beastly creatures emerged from the tree line with the same sinister appearance. This was the point of no return. 
We had no choice but to face our end with whatever courage we had left. Then, as if it sensed our dreadful acceptance of impending doom, something extraordinary happened. The first creature stepped forward, placing itself between us and its companions. As if in communication with them, the other creatures hesitated and then returned to the darkness of the forest. The creature that protected us reveled in its victory. Its eyes glowed with triumph while letting out a deep, spine-shivering howl. This second howl resonated differently from when we heard it just a few nights ago. It carried a sense of closure and command. As it turned away from us and into the darkness of the woods, following its companion's paths, one final glance was thrown at us with a hint of intelligence and understanding far beyond what any wild animal could possess. Then it vanished. In shaken silence, we dragged ourselves back into the tent and huddled together once more. Sleep eluded us as we remained wide awake until sunrise, processing every improbable event of that horrendous night. When morning finally arrived at 6.45 a.m., no trace of the previous night's terror was left in sight except for our scattered supplies and our scarred minds. It took all our strength to pack up and leave that place behind with haste. We vowed never to speak of that weekend again, to pretend as though it never happened, and never to set foot in those woods again. And though days turned into years without an answer or explanation for what the terrifying beings were, many have theorized they were protectors, guarding us from an even greater danger lurking within those haunted trees. I'm convinced there are things out there, unseen creatures, that defy explanation. Yet they exist on an entirely different plane than we can comprehend. My only hope is that whatever divine intervention took place that wretched night will not be forgotten, as some mysteries should be left unsolved. They only serve as reminders that we are not alone in this vast world.